clearly guided from the public. I guess this matter would officially have to be settled at the appropriate forum. So I hereby give such notice. Um, Mr. Finance Minister, let me let me let me check with the with the with the uh, our clerk. I think the letter to the uh, minister, you did indicate that he was at liberty to um, file a written statement or to give an opening statement or something to that effect. Is that right? Look at the letter and confirm. Yes, that, that is the case, the first uh, letter we sent to you. Okay. Um, so we, we believe that you have a, a written statement, which you may want to go through and uh, subsequently hand a copy over to um, uh, the committee or you, you will do it at, at, your, at, your, at your own pace and convenience. Um, we have decided on the matters that uh, you're going to uh, discuss with us and the matters that you won't be discussing. Um, I've uh, asked my colleague um, to um, deal with um, the, 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 that aspect of uh, the proceedings for today. So, Doc, um, deal with the two matters that uh, we intend not to invite him to um, uh, explain to the committee. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Katie Hammond, the co-chair. Um, right, I mean, Honorable Minister, the motion as advertised um, on the other paper of Parliament contained seven grounds. And for the purposes of today's proceedings, I would want to take them seriously. That is one after the other. Um, the first ground is despicable conflict of interest ensuring that he directly benefits from Ghana's economic woes as his companies receive commissions and other unethical contractual advantages, particularly from Ghana's debt overhang. That's ground number one. Ground number two says unconstitutional withdrawals from the consolidated fund in blatant contravention of Article 178 of the 1992 Constitution, supposedly for the construction of the President's Cathedral. Ground number three, illegal payment of oil revenues into offshore accounts in flagrant violation of Article 176 of the Constitution. Ground number four, deliberate and dishonest misreporting of economic data to Parliament. <clears throat> Ground number five, fiscal recklessness leading to the crash of the Ghana city which is currently the worst performing currency in the world. Ground number six, alarming incompetence and the lightning ineptitude, frightening, sorry, ineptitude resulting in the collapse of the Ghanaian economy and an excruciating cost of living crisis. And ground number seven and the last one, gross mismanagement of the Ghanaian economy, which has occasioned untold and unprecedented hardship. Honorable Minister, you recall that on Tuesday, the 15th day of November 2022, um, when you attended upon this committee, uh, not as a witness, but as a, uh, the person of interest that was invited, um, your counsel, uh, Mr. Gabi Ochildako, Esquire, uh, raised an objection, a preliminary objection to ground number one, that is the one dealing with the conflict of interest. And in summary, basically what he <clears throat> said was that um, this committee, as a committee of parliament, did not have um, jurisdiction, so to speak, to inquire into this matter or investigate the matter, given the fact that in terms of the Constitution, uh, particularly Article 287 of the Constitution, that is within the remit of the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice. Now, he further indicated to the committee that this matter has been settled by the courts because there was a suit which involved your good self and the Attorney General that went through the court system all the way to the Supreme Court of the Republic. And the decision was uh, in your favor. And therefore, he found it uh, unacceptable that we were inquiring into the same matter. I mean, the, the committee has its own view of that particular case, which we will express in our written report. However, he also cited the case of... Uh, Ablakwa and another, the Attorney General and another, uh, which is reported in the uh, 2012 to Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report um, 845. 
And he said that on account of that decision, the settled law is that um, it is always right that can inquire into and investigate matters of conflict of interest. So basically he uh, argued against the position which was adopted by the Honorable Minority Leader to the effect that in terms of Article 103, Clause 3 of the Constitution, committees of parliament can inquire and investigate into matters uh, affecting the administration of ministries and departments. And therefore, this committee was seized with jurisdiction. The committee has considered the uh, objection raised by your counsel, and we will uh, provide a, wit a written report, I mean a written ruling, which will be contained in our report. But we think that in light of those objections, you should not be called upon to answer questions relating to matters, I mean, of conflict of interest, uh, as uh, stated in ground one. Then also, ground number three, relating to illegal payments of all revenues into offshore accounts in flagrant violation of Article 176 of the 1992 Constitution. When the evidence was adduced, there was a specific um, piece of evidence uh, relating to the payment of 100 million US dollars into an offshore account. account. And the uh, documentary evidence that was tended was a report of the PIAC, that is the Public Interest and Accountability uh, Committee. And when, because we wanted the evidence corroborated, we invited PIAC to appear before us yesterday. They did appear. A specific question was put to them with respect to whether or not they are aware that you in particular instructed that the monies be transferred into an offshore account. PIAC did say that they could not confirm that fact. Subsequently, the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, that is GMPC, was called upon on, in respect of that issue because these were proceeds of the sale of the liftings of oil by Jubilee Holdings, which is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of um, you know, GMPC. And so we called upon GMPC to corroborate or disaffirm the evidence which was, I mean, alert with respect to this matter by the proponents of the, I mean, of the, um, the motion. And GMPC described the transaction as follows, that the monies were paid by Talo, Ghana Limited, and they were paid to Jubilee Holdings into an account that is held by Jubilee Holdings uh, with Ghana International Bank in London. Um, they also did not say anything to the effect that you gave any instructions with respect to that payment. And so on account of the evidence adduced, uh, which kind of contradicted the evidence that was laid uh, by the proponents of the bill, I mean by the proponents of the motion, uh, the committee has taken the view that you will not be called upon to deal with this uh, matter. Of course, members may have some ancillary issues arising out of the evidence of GMPC that they may be interested in, but I'll leave it to members to deal with. So in essence, uh, uh, my, uh, my co-chair, there are now five grounds that you have to deal with, Honorable Minister, and uh, those are grounds two, <clears throat> that is the unconstitutional withdrawals in relation to the, national, the famous National Cathedral, um, is described in the motion as the President's Cathedral. Um, but I think uh, the official I mean, name of the cathedral is a national cathedral. Then we have ground four, five, six, and seven to deal with. So, Coche and honorable members, this is uh, the order of business uh, for this morning. Honorable Minister, do you have any questions with respect to what I've said so far? Okay. So, <clears throat> if not, Camilo's. Have you, have, you okay the, have you checked with the letter? I mean, the letter confirming that we said you should uh, either get the written uh, um, paper to us or whatever. Have we confirmed that there is a written statement from him? No, no, I, well, I, I did speak to the, I mean, you remember I asked you to, to confirm me. Yeah, confirm. Yeah, yeah. Let's this morning, then we can. We'll, we will do that. But have you confirmed that he's got that statement? No, he hasn't done so. So let him. Sorry, sorry. Yes, the confirmation that he's got it. He's not going to give evidence now. Yes, yeah, precise. No, no, the statement that we indicated in the letter that he was entitled to present. Have you conferred with him whether he has it? This morning. Uh, 
Um, but I, I thought you would just walk to him and then find out. You had a clerk to the committee. You know, simply you know, going on to find out from him doesn't. Um, the the coaches have have conferred with the witness. Um, he's having a written uh, statement to submit, but he would uh, first and foremost make the oral submissions, and after that, then he would tender it. That's good. All right. So, uh, who, who the check clerk to? Yeah. Uh, get on with the the clerk, Mr. Clark, please. Call me, please. You are, disrupt, you are distracting the clerk. Can you swear in the Honorable Minister? Can you repeat after me? I, I, Kenneth Nanaya Kuntun Kruko Furiata, swear by the Almighty God, swear by the Almighty God, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, before this committee, before this committee, touching the matter in issue, touching the matter in issue, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, I see you are surrounded by uh, persons who are obviously here to assist you in your test with your testimony. Uh, if you may introduce them to the committee, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Co-Chair. I'll have them introduce themselves. Legal counsel on my right and Minister of Finance on my left. Honorable Co-Chair, respectfully, my name is Ado Etia, and I'm lead counsel for the witness, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Kalukoriata. And with me is my learned friend who will introduce himself. Uh, okay, yes. No, he's asking, inviting the co-counsel to introduce himself. Most respectfully, Honorable Co-Chair, my name is Jacob Aqua Samson. I'm part of the Minister's legal team. Very well. Um, I see around the table a number of uh, ministers and honorable members of parliament, colleagues of ours, uh, who are here. Yes, so I will ask them to introduce themselves. Please, please, please. As a matter of... You no. have to introduce themselves. Are your colleagues, you know. No, no, of, of course. So I mean, okay. No, well, so, so that is fine. So we have the honorable uh, Dominic Nitoul, the MP for Bimbila, and uh, Minister of Defense, uh, the Honorable uh, Dan Bochwe, uh, the General himself, the Minister for Local Government, the Honorable um, Roku, my brother, um, Deputy Minister of uh, Energy, and then the, the Honorable Minister for Transport, uh, CMA, Honorable ACMA. Yeah, and then, of course, the Honorable Deputy Minister of Finance, uh, Abina Ose uh, Asari. So you're all, wel you all welcome to the committee. Hey, sorry, the Honorable Ricky Sagan, MP for Cape Coast uh, South. Yes, and former Deputy Minister of uh, Trade and then, of course, of Finance. So did I leave anyone out? No. <coughs> OK. Yes, yes um, Eva, Yes, Yes. Can you um, introduce, introduce yourself, I, you know, uh, and your portfolio at the ministry. Thank you very much, Honorable <coughs> Chair. My name is Eva Mens. I am coordinating director of the Ministry of Finance. All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> All right. Um, 
and then we'll settle now. Mr. As I indicated, take it the way you want it. At the appropriate juncture, if we intend to interrupt you and ask you any questions, we would. Um, but let's see how it plays out. So you can, you can start. Thank you very much, um, co-chairs and members. Um, Asum Jane Kanye, now peace be unto all of us. Uh, honorable co-chairs and members of this ad hoc committee, uh, good morning through you, good morning to the Ghanaian people. Uh, I believe this process we are engaging here it's a useful opportunity to strengthen our democratic processes. Um, Co-chairs, it's a very difficult um, process. According to my understanding of parliamentary history, this might be the first censure of a minister. So it must be very grave issues that we are having to address. It's therefore unfortunate that um, in the co-chair's summation of the two grounds that have been struck out, it sounds to me like there was not a thorough review of the grounds as should have been. But to bring somebody for censure would require that these things are done of absolute thoroughness. But I'm pleased with the decision that have been made. Honorable co-chairs, during the course of my remarks this morning, you can expect forthrightness. The proponent's motion of censure has accused me of many things and include some very disparaging remarks and attacks on my person and integrity. I'm certain that Ghanaians will have a more balanced view of the events that led us here as I take the opportunity to speak to the martyrs so raised. My principal reflections today are to ensure that by the end of these proceedings, the truth would have taken center stage and in the process any unfounded doubts about my motives, my competence, and my character would have been dispelled. Before I proceed with my detailed responses, I'd like to make a personal comment to the Ghanaian people. Since the Akufuado government came into office in 2017, everything we have sought to do was aimed at making the lives of the people better. We have been focused on this vision to improve lives, and in the first four years, our efforts were leading to a realization of the vision. Today, I acknowledge our economy is facing difficulties and the people of Ghana are enduring hardships. As a person President Akufuado has put in charge of this economy, I feel the pain personally, professionally, and in my soul. I see and feel the terrible impact of rising prices of goods and services on the lives and livelihoods of ordinary Ghanaians. I feel the stress of running a business, but it is the strength and perseverance of the Ghanaian people that inspire me and my colleagues in government every morning. And it's to press on. That is what gives me the strength to press on, to find solutions and relief for Ghanaians to the myriad of problems that our country and the rest of the world are facing, especially since March 2020. Co-chairs, let me use this opportunity to say to the Ghanaian people what I believe with courage every finance minister around the world may wish to say to their people now. I am truly sorry. When we set out so purposefully between 2017 and the early parts of 2020, 
we never imagined that a global pandemic such as COVID with its prolonged economic fallout would inflict such pain and suffering upon the Ghanaian people. The shock to our system has been hard and the impact on our livelihoods severe. But we have not been resting on our oars. We continue to work to keep the lights on, to avoid the queues at our filling stations as in other countries. Our classrooms are full. Our hospitals and dispensaries mostly stocked with medicine. We continue to pay salaries and our roads continue to be built and fixed. Now let me get to the details. On the issue relating to despicable conflict of interests, ensuring that I directly benefit from Ghana's economic woes. No, Mr. Minister. We just ruled that. No, no, no. no wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, we already made a ruling that um, you are not to deal with the item number one and you are not to deal with the item number uh, three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have indeed well, subsequently received a letter dated 16th November yeah. 2022 <coughs> stating that this committee yes. has upheld that of set of judgment. Yes, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, in contradistinction uh, to what my uh, Honorable Co-Chair has said, um, in terms of um, Article 82 for the Constitution, the Minister would have been entitled to be heard in his defense during the debate. And we have read, yeah, we have, oh, I'm being consistent, uh, Honorable Kiji. Yes, yeah, so what, what I'm saying is that it is, it is. What my colleagues seem to be saying is that even though the committee is rude, yes. if you, the minister of your own volition, want to discuss it, then maybe go ahead. But, but let's, let's, let's think about it. Is that, is that the ruling? Is that the, is that the sense of the committee? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Council. Yeah. Uh, but, but yes. Honorable coaches, um, we appreciate uh, um, your position on this matter, except that if he's being invited to speak to those issues that have been struck out, are you going to ask him questions because he's addressed them? Yes. Uh, Council, that is a, the natural course of events. If he, he comments on them, he testifies on them, he opens himself up to questions by the co members of the committee. So it's up to you, you know, if your client wants to go on that trajectory, uh, we, we are fine, but if he doesn't... So let's, let's explain a little bit further. We didn't take the decision lightly. We looked at the constitutional imperatives. We looked at the decision of a Shiraj. That matter went as far as to the Supreme Court. We looked at that, and we thought that in uh, criminal jurisprudence, it would be double jeopardy asking him to revisit this matter. In civil jurisprudence, it would be abuse of the process to ask him to be res judicata. We've gone through all those matters. But that is the sense of the committee. If uh, your client believes that, uh, in spite of the ruling, he wants to uh, still help the committee on some matters we may not have been aware of, is entirely um, um, entitled um, to. But of course, as we indicated, if he does, then of course our colleagues uh, would want to ask some questions of him. That is not to say that he has anything in his hiding. That's not a point. Honorable coaches, thank you very much. Um, we have advised that in as much as those um, grounds have been struck off the record, we will not speak to them respectfully. So he can proceed to the next ground, which is the unconstitutional withdrawals from uh, 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 unconstitutional withdrawals in respect of the cathedral. Thank you very much, coaches. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, the next is the grounds of the proponents claiming that there has been unconstitutional withdrawals from the consolidated fund in blatant contravention of Article 178.
of the 1992 Constitution, supposedly for the construction of the President's Cathedral. It's a coach that took me for a loop since I did not know what the President's Cathedral was. Honorable Co-Chairs, let me first submit that I'm uncomfortable about the formulation of this ground. It presupposes that Parliament is assuming the jurisdiction to enforce and or interpret the provision of the Constitution against the combined effect of Articles 2, 1, and 131, which grants the sole and exclusive power to the Supreme Court. Nonetheless, I say with both humility and confidence that I have not breached the Constitution in making payments to support the construction of the National Cathedral of Ghana. Uh, Mr. Minister, Mr. Gochaman, uh, clarify that I don't quite comprehend the point you make. Um, the committee uh, seems to be assuming what constitutional, um, uh, uh, assuming constitutional position that you don't believe uh, uh, we are entitled to. There is an allegation that some monies have been withdrawn from the constitution, uh, from the uh, consolidated fund. Uh, the point made by the proponents is that they believe that those monies were withdrawn unconstitutionally. We are not here to interpret any constitution. Um, just simply asking you to respond to that allegation, whether it is true or not, we have no clue. So. Um, if you challenge the constitutionality of it, let's hear your, your, your grounds uh, in respect of that. Then. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Co-Chair, let, let me um, then proceed um, to really um, talk about exactly what you have. You may well do. Honorable Co-Chairs, three days ago, when the proponents were here, they alleged I had made payments from the contingency fund to support the National Cathedral. I want to state that this is just not true. Let me be categorical. I have taken no money from the contingency fund to make payments for the National Cathedral. It appears the proponents have confused the contingency fund with the contingency vote. Let me explain. There is a difference between contingency fund and contingency vote. The contingency fund the proponents refer to is wholly covered under the Constitution under the Constitution, specifically under Article 177. This constitutes money voted by Parliament, and advances from this must be authorized by the Parliamentary Finance Committee. The contingency vote, on the other hand, is a line under the other government obligations vote, which is approved by the Finance Committee and passed as part of the Annual Appropriation Acts passed by Parliament. Honorable Co-Chairs, in preparing the annual budgets, the practice is that provision is made for indicative expenditures that have not been fully costed at the time of the budget presentation. Provisions are made in the contingency vote to cater for such expenditures. For example, in 2014, there was no specific allocation in the 2014 budget for Ghana's participation in the FIFA World Cup in Brazil. The Cabinet of President John Mahama in March 2014 at the time approved then some $9.622 million for that tournament, including that amount which was flown to Brazil in a private jet for the players. A more current example is Ghana's participation in Qatar. The Black Stars qualified for the 2022 FIFA World Cup way after the 2022 budget presented on 16 November 2021 was approved by Parliament. No specific amount was thus budgeted for it, but through the contingency vote, we have been able to provide funds legitimately for the team to participate in the competition. Expenditures in respect of the National Cathedral were made from the contingency vote under the other government obligations vote as has been the practice before my tenure. I have copies of several payments from the contingency vote dating back to 2015 to share. Honorable Co-Chairs, as Finance Minister, I'm fully aware of the approval procedures for use of the contingency fund and have not breached its requirements. The National Cathedral is 100% owned by the state and it's not the President's Cathedral 
as described by the proponents. Indeed, the Attorney General issued an opinion on 6 January 2022 that the National Cathedral is a state-owned company limited by guarantee under the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board. Honorable Co-Chairs, the policy direction and updates on the National Cathedral have been publicly presented over the years through the National Budget Statement and Economic Policy presented to Parliament. In paragraph 158 of my budget speech on the, on the 2019 Budget Statement Economic Policy, I announced on the floor of Parliament government's vision for the National Cathedral, as well as a commitment to facilitate the construction by providing the land, the secretariat, and seed money. This subject was part of the policy approval of the budget after the extensive debate. Subsequently, regular updates on the progress of the construction of the National Cathedral have been provided to Parliament and the nation. These include 2020 Budget Statement Economic Policy, Paragraph 385, which announced the establishment of the Board of Trustees and Secretariat for the Cathedrals. Media review of the 2020 Budget Statement, Paragraph 279, which provided an update on the groundbreaking ceremony held on 5th March 2020 to mark the formal commencement of the construction phase of the project. 2021 Budget Statement Economic Policy, Paragraphs 1132 and 1134, which informed the House of the Letter of Intent signed on 25th November 2020 between the National Cathedral of Ghana Trustees and Ribad JV led by Rizani, Babisoti and Sons and Desimoni. And also the appointment of Apostle Professor Opoku Nina as new Chairman of the Board of Trustees on 8 February 2021. The media review of the 2021 Budget Statement, paragraphs 354 and 355 which announced the expansion of the cathedral project to include a Bible Museum, Bible Museum of Africa, and Biblical Gardens, as well as the establishment of the 100 CD a month Ketua Beer and Swag Club, in line with the original plan to encourage as many donors as possible to contribute towards the establishment of this national monument. In conclusion, co-chairs, all the payments made for the National Cathedral were lawfully done and from the contingency vote under the other government obligations vote and not from the contingency fund as alleged by the proponents. Um, oh, hold it, Mr. Minister. Um, hold it a minute. Let's, let's go. I don't worry if you become privy to what we discuss. We're wondering whether at this stage we should ask you questions after you finish with the first allegation or let you finish um, with the law. I think the consensus is that finish with your presentation and then we'll ask uh, questions if we do have any. Thank you very much. And I will also submit the Attorney General's um, opinion on that. Thank you very much. I will go through all the grounds um, and then we can focus on the questions. So, Honorable Minister, you have to go to ground four. Ground four. Deliberate and dishonest misreporting of economic data to Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Co-Chair. Let me now focus on the grounds claiming deliberate and dishonest misreporting of economic data to Parliament. The issue of deliberate misreporting of economic data to Parliament is not just unfortunate, but simply untrue. I am, for that matter, the Ministry of Finance have never misreported data to Parliament, as has been alleged. On Tuesday, 13th November 2022, the proponents clarified that their concerns relating to the reporting of fiscal data. In their submission, they alleged that different sets of data were presented to the IMF and the people of Ghana. That is untrue. 
The 2019 Article 4, which they cited, actually clearly demonstrates that the computing and reporting of the deficit is consistent between the government and the IMF, as shown on the table labeled Ghana, Selected Economic and Financial Indicators, 2017 to 2024, on page 4 of the IMF Article 4 and Appendix 3A of the 2019 budget. More importantly, we were under a fund program during that period and could not have been able to exit the program if there were inaccuracies of the data we reported and the methodology used for computing the deficit. In actual fact, in the most recent IMF Article 4 report from 2021, one sees clearly demonstrated that the methodology utilized in computing the deficit is and has been consistent as shown in the tables labeled Ghana Selected Economic Financial Indicators 2019 to 22 on page 3 of the press release numbered PR 21 stroke 221. According to Honorable Arthur Forson, Mr. Chairman, paragraph 16, page 11, I'm quoting of the staff report, Article 4 says, Fiscal Rules under Ghana. Public Financial Management Act Fiscal Rules could be strengthened, Box 1. It goes on to say that about 2.8 percentage point of GDP in financial <coughs> energy sector payments were recorded below the line in the year 2019 budget because the government considers the financial sector cost as a one-off an energy cost as a debt amortization. Best international practices could include these transactions above the line as they reflect either direct government obligation or government transactions transfers to state-owned enterprises. Because of the exceptional nature of the expenditure, the chairs, financial sector cleanup and energy sector IPP payments, we agreed with the fund that it could be treated below the line as shown in the table earlier. Coaches, it is also alleged that I have breached the second fiscal rule under the Fiscal Responsibility Act 2018, Act 982, namely the primary balance in 2018 and 2019. Firstly, I maintain the legal position that Act 982 was not passed to take a retrospective effect. It is equally instructive to note that the fiscal and primary balance target presented to Parliament for those two years did not have any estimate on the fencing cleanup cost above the line. Consequently, the primary balance target that we were targeting were actually surpluses of 1.6% of GDP in the main budget for 2018 and 1.1% in 2019. This, per our definition, included the FINSA cleanup costs that, if applicable, could not be used to breach the law. To reiterate, the agreed style of reporting with the IMF was to show both a deficit including FINSA cleanup and one excluding it. I wish to state that the allegation of deliberate misreporting of economic data to Parliament is completely not true. Since I took office in 2017, I have served the country with integrity and honesty. Under my leadership at the Ministry of Finance, there have been significant improvements in the accurate reporting of public finances. Today, under President Nana Kufuado, Ghanaians are enjoying greater accountability and transparency in the management of the public purse than any other period under the Fourth Republic. Since 2017, government has complied with the reporting provisions in the Public Financial Management Act 2016, Act 921, including budget implementation report, fiscal reports, public debt report, petroleum revenue management reports, ESLA reports, etc. The proponents have raised the issue of treatment of energy sector IPP payments and financial sector cleanup payments in the fiscal tables. The Minister of Finance has explained its position on the treatment of these two items to the relevant committees of Parliament during their scrutiny of the annual budget from 2018 to 2021. The Minister of Finance actually issued a press release on the subject on 10th May 2020, which, would have hoped, which we had hoped should have put this matter to rest. 
The ministry included the energy sector IPP payments in the amortization line in the fiscal framework during the 2018 to 2081 period. Financial sector cleanup costs were included in the fiscal framework annually for the period 2018 to 2021 to reflect the issuances of bonds to cover the non-cash costs. Contrary to the position of others that the Ministry of Finance did not reflect the FinSec payments and the energy sector IPP payments in the fiscal framework, I want to emphasize with the budget document as evidence that these payments were reflected in the fiscal framework. Energy sector IPP payments were treated as amortization and the non-cash financial sector cleaner payments were reflected in the memo item referred to Appendix 2A of the fiscal tables in the relevant annual budget. The MOF reflected the FinSec cleanup payments in the memo item called fiscal deficit for the following reasons. They are extraordinary one-time payment items which need not be mixed up with traditional fiscal operations. And they are largely bonds and capturing them above the line will imply recognizing their payments now and recognize their payments again when the payments fall due in the future, a possible double counting. A method that the proponent is or ought to have been very familiar with from his years as Deputy Minister for Finance. Likewise, the energy sector IPP payments were reflected in the fiscal framework as part of the amortization line under the financing part of the fiscal table for the following reason. They are debts of SOEs that have been assumed by government and are largely contingent liabilities that have crystallized for payments. And two, there are extraordinary one-off payments which need not be mixed up with also traditional expenditure items. However, the MOF agreed with the Finance Committee of Parliament in 2021 that going forward from 2022 onwards, both the energy IPP payments and the FinSIC payments will be treated above the line in the fiscal framework for the following reasons. One, the FinSIC bailout exercise is largely completed and therefore ceases to be an extraordinary budget item. And two, IPP payments are expected to be made over the medium term, given that they've become explicit contingent liabilities, appropriately budgeting for them above the line ensures the resources are duly allocated for their settlement. The 2022 budget therefore reflects this decision, neither the ministry nor I have deliberately or dishonestly reported economic data to Parliament. This is buttressed by the submissions made in May 2020 by the IMF Country Director, Dr. Albert Mama, and I quote, our number includes these two elements, financial sector payments and energy sector payments, that's the IMF. And we know why the Governor of Bank of Ghana made the decision not to have these two elements in the fiscal deficits. Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman, there's also a claim going on to the next question. Grounds? It's uh, ground, ground number five. Incompetence and all those things. No, the fiscal recklessness leading to the crash of the Ghana city. Yes, that is it. And Minister, kindly proceed. Thank you very much. I'll tend a document in on the government finance statistics for your records. Honorable Minister, what document is that and who published it? Um, this is a document from the Ministry of Finance okay. on Ghana finance, the government's finance statistics. Okay. Is it, was it uh, published, laid in Parliament, you know, published? Uh... No, it's an in-house memo. Oh. An in-house memo. Who prepared it? 
No, it's, it's important. If it is a public document. It's not a public you know, document. Right. And but if it's not. Well, of course. I mean, if it forms part of your statement, that is fine. So in terms of the probative value, we'll see what value we can place on it. I think it will be helpful. Because if, yeah, as if part it is of my statement. Very well. So very I'll, well. I'll tender it in when I'm tendering all the Very statement. well. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. you can attach it to your, your statement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Coaches, there's also a claim on fiscal recklessness leading to the crush of the Ghana CD, which is currently the worst performing currency in the world. I respond as follows. Honorable co-chairs, the grounds of recklessness presupposes that I have not been guided by the laid down regulations. I want to state that I have not been reckless in the management of the fiscal operations of government. Rather, our strenuous efforts to protect the public purse is what has helped this government to have achieved much, much more than any government ever over a similar period in virtually all sectors including education, health, social welfare, policing, security in general, roads, railways, agriculture, industrialization, tourism, digitization, and funding for anti-corruption institutions. Honorable co-chairs, I've come to Parliament House 10 times, 11 times since this government in the last six years to present the annual and mid-year budgets. On all occasions, I have discussed all proposed fiscal operations of government revenue expenditure and financing. On all these occasions, I receive approval as Parliament subsequently pass appropriation bills for all those budgets. Every key expenditure made has been supported by this House. Indeed, we also saw that there are consequences when the House for months refused to pass a major revenue generation item introduced by this government to support the fiscal stability of the economy. Sadly, the minority leader, when this government was compelled to approach the fund this year, triumphantly took credit for frustrating, for frustrating government's efforts to meet its half-year revenue targets. He told the parliamentary press call last June that thanks to the opposition, government has already lost half-year revenue. That can only be attributed to the purpose and tenacity of the minority group in parliament, unquote. The consequences of this intentional stance have been dire. It precipitated a lack of confidence in the international market and close access to Ghana's traditional eurobond issuance. Honorable co-chairs, it is worthwhile to note that indeed the proponents offered only one item as not having been approved by Parliament for payment, the National Cathedral of Ghana, and I have shown that to be untrue. I hope we can take it that by extension of their proposition, they accept that all other expenditures have been approved by Parliament. We must all boldly share in the positive achievements regularly reported by the Bank of Ghana in its quarterly fiscal development reports for the years 2017 to 2021. Honorable Co-Chairs, it cannot be sustained that I've been reckless in supporting the implementation of the decisions of Parliament. Honorable Co-Chairs, with the approval of funds by Parliament, in the last six years, we have undertaken major transformative investments to improve the quality of life of Ghanaians. We have mobilized and invested in excess of 28.3 billion as of September 2022 to implement the transformative flagship programs that improve social mobility and the quality of life of Ghanaians. Most of these did not exist prior to 2017. This includes supporting 1,765,977 Ghanaian students and a free SHS TVET to promote Ghan human capital development and social mobility. Enrolling 15,656,160 Ghanaians age 15 years and above on the National Identification Program by September 2021 to enhance security and economic efficiency. Support of 100,000 young graduates to enter the job market. Providing needed infrastructure to support decentralization and local governance to expand access to public services under the Regional Reorganization Program. 
promoting the development of railway network to advance national and regional connectivity supporting the ongoing construction of fishing harbours to service key coastal communities including Axim, Diskop, Mori, Mumford, Winneba, Senyabriku, Gomwa, Fete, Teshi, and Jamestown. Increasing school feeding beneficiaries from 1,677,322 in 2016 to 3,300,000 pupils in 2021. Increasing LEAP beneficiaries from 195 1,860 households in 2017 to 344,023 in 2021 to improve the livelihoods for the underprivileged in our society. Increasing food production and security through planting for food and jobs has led to a 71% increase in the national production of maize and 34% in paddy rice. We have invested significantly in retooling security sector to maintain territorial integrity and improve internal security. CCTVs, motorbikes, vehicles, forward operating bases, recruitment of security personnel, etc. We have recruited over 200,000 Ghanaians into crucial services such as education, health, security, and local government. Established a tree crop development authority with a focus on mango, cashew, rubber, oil palm, shear, and coconut in order to diversify our economy and provide raw materials for industrialization. This and many more we have done. Honorable Co Chairs, the idea that the appreciation of the city is a result of fiscal recklessness is not supported by the available facts. The Ghana City consistently performed very well throughout my tenure as Finance Minister up to March 2022. The records show that between 2012 and 2016, the city depreciated by an average of 17 percent, whilst between 2017 and 2021, the average rate of depreciation was 7 percent. The major contributors to the currency problem are not necessarily fiscal factors. Honorable Co-Chairs, Unlike July 2014, when the city was last rated as a worst current performing currency, the 2022 depreciation is largely attributed to extraordinary global factors, including the strength of the U.S. dollar, even against the major international currencies like the U.K. pound, the yen, and the euro. And speculation due to economic uncertainties, for example, in this year, 2022, the euro is worth less than the dollar for the first time in 20 years. As stipulated in Article 183 of the Constitution, Section 2A, the Bank of Ghana shall promote and maintain the stability of the currency of Ghana and direct and regulate the currency system in the interest of the economic progress of Ghana. As such, the Bank of Ghana, which manages our reserves, is leading the interventions to contain the depreciation of the city. Government on its part is undertaking real sector interventions through initiatives such as 1D1F and the Ghana Cares Program to accelerate the import substitution and export-led economy such that products such as poultry and rice would be produced here to reduce foreign exchange pressures from the imports of these products. We intend to announce additional measures to promote the consumption of local produce. Furthermore, the implementation of the AFCFTA positions Ghana as a continental trade hub, and we shall take advantage and boost the export orientation of our industries. The Ministry of Finance has also arranged significant financing, including the $750 million from AfriExim Bank to support the 2022 budget and boost our foreign exchange reserves. This forest inflow has improved the supply of foreign currency and boosted the stability of the local currency. We continue to explore avenues to secure additional financing to boot the country's reserve position. Coaches, on the issue of alarming incompetence and frightening ineptitude resulting in the collapse of the Ghanaian economy and an excruciating cost of living crisis. 
that is six. I state as follows. These are very, very strong languages. And it is unfortunate, as also was the one on recklessness. Honorable co-chairs, the choice of words for these is worrying, especially as it relates to the functioning of the whole national economy and is resulting in the censure of the Minister for Finance. The truth is considerable progress has been made under my tenure as Minister for Finance since 2017. Honorable co-chairs, we have competently managed the economy since 2017. Indeed, to appreciate where we are now, we need to look back at where we came from. At the close of 2016, an assessment of the economy revealed limited fiscal space deficit of 6.5%, a distressed financial sector, non-performing loans ratio of about 17.3%, an asset quality review document that had not been triggered, a derailed IMF ECF program, and reduced economic output of negative 3.4%. Inflation was 15.4% at the end of 2016, and monetary policy rate was 25.5% at the end of December 2016. Limited capital expenditure to MDAs, DUMSO, which had decimated, decimated local industry and strongly impeded national productivity. Honorable co-chairs, it is important to note that through our leadership and commitment to turn around the economy from its state in 2016, we made great strides and remarkable progress in the years before the pandemic, and the records attest to this. The headline facts were, we doubled economic growth in our first three years, and Ghana's growth in 2019 was touted as one of the highest globally. Inflation came down significantly from 15.4% to 7.9%, at the end of 2019 and remained in single digits till the pandemic hit in March 2020. The fiscal deficit, which was about 6.5%, was brought down to under 5% by the end of 2019. Exchange rate depreciation reduced significantly to under 5% in 2017 and averaging 8.7% between 2017 and 2019. We reduce interest rates in line of declining inflation expectations. Monetary policy rate declined from 25.5% at the end of December 2016 to 16% at the end of 2019, while the average lending rate for the same period declined from 31.7% to 23.7%. The government directly spent $25 billion to save the banking and SDI sector, protecting the near collapse of the financial sector saving close to 5,400 direct jobs, 12,000 indirect jobs, and making sure that 4.6 million depositors were protected. And government also implemented comprehensive reforms across the energy sector and kept the lights on to date. On the back of good economic management, Ghana successfully completed and exited the IMF ECF program that we inherited in April 2019. To ensure irreversibility of the macroeconomic gains, government introduced a number of measures, including passage of the Fiscal Responsibility Act 2018, Act 982, to cap the fiscal deficit at 5% of GDP and ensure maintenance of positive primary balance. Passage of the Public Financial Management Regulations 2019, LI2378, to strengthen regulation of the public financial management system, establishment of two social partnership programs with labor and faith-based organizations. Clearly, there was strong momentum and optimism towards Ghana beyond aid at the end of 2019. However, with the onset of the pandemic, the gains from over three years of fiscal rectitude were reversed as a result of efforts to ensure lives and livelihoods were protected. Ultimately, 
These considerations inform the raft of revenue and expenditure measures outlined in the 2022 budget statement. We laid out the 2022 budget to achieve fiscal consolidation anchored on debt sustainability. It is important at this point to also highlight that the key component of the national debt stock related to three exceptional expenditure items that are neither external nor a creation of this government. Energy sector excess capacity payments, 17 billion, which relates to a legacy of take or pay contracts that saddle the country's economy with annual payments in excess capacity charges of close to a billion dollars. Direct COVID-19 expenditure amounted to Ghana CDs 12 billion, the banking sector cleanup of 25 billion. These three items alone contribute to about 23% of our annual debt servicing costs. These three items were not created from the recklessness of our party. The long doing so that Ghanaians endured during the NDC administration between 2012 and 2016 was more to do with NDC's government ability to pay for power. So co-chairs, I find it curious that Honorable Arthur Forsen would choose to cite energy bills as an example of the recklessness that the minority charges me with and seek my removal by censure. Honorable co-chairs, in actual fact, we have been able to renegotiate some of these power purchase agreements and the new agreements when implemented with the priority IPPs when finalized will estimated save us $4 billion a year over the next five years. We have also used a significant part of the borrowing to undertake key transformative investments, such as the fixing construction of over 11,500 kilometers of new roads between 2017 and 2021. The construction of 12 major interchanges since 2017 as compared to five interchanges in the previous eight years, previous to 2016, construction of the Eastern Regional and Central Gonja Hospitals, commencement work on 87 of the Agenda 1111 um, District Hospitals projects, funding ongoing airport projects, including the Kumasi International Airport, promoting the establishment of the Development Bank of Ghana to provide competitive long-term financing for Ghanaian enterprises. Indeed, the E-Levy was born out of this heightened need to mobilize resources sufficient for managing the preeminent challenges of our time, fiscal consolidation, debt sustainability, and reducing youth unemployment. Unfortunately, the delay in the passage contributed, impacted really the confidence of the international market and largely contributed to the ensuing downgrade in Ghana's sovereign credit rating in January 2022. This resulted in Ghana being closed from the international markets and not being able, therefore, to issue its euro bonds as it traditionally does in the first quarter. So we lost confidence in the international investors. For this reason, access to international capital market funds was no longer available which resulted in a severe balance of payment problem that needs to be addressed, and we are addressing. The government thus resorted to the IMF as a lender of last resort in July to not only address the immediate and active balance of payment need, but also to protect all the macro and social policy gains made in the last five years. Undoubtedly, the last few months have seen considerable economic uncertainty and challenges these have been characterized by high inflation, rapid depreciation of the city. Indeed, the economic challenges we are facing require deliberate but urgent, well thought out strategic steps, as well as the support of all of the Ghanaian people. The above notwithstanding, there are still some bright spots. Overall, our growth outturn of 3.4% and 4.8% in quarter one and quarter two, 2022, respectively, coupled of modest improvement in our fiscal position suggests our economy is gradually on the aspen despite the numerous shocks we have faced over the past two years. The progress, this progress gives us a solid foundation to confront the challenges in front of us. Undoubtedly, risks remain 
that we are highly attuned to. However, the Ministry of Finance is committed to working alongside all stakeholders, including the members of Parliament, to ensure we can reposition our economy back on a path of growth and prosperity. Mr. Co-Chairs, there's a claim of gross mismanagement of the Ghanaian economy which has occasioned untold and unprecedented hardship. Honorable Co-Chairs, the current economic challenges we are experiencing in Ghana is not the outcome of mismanagement, but we acknowledge the hardships our people are going through in these very difficult times. This assessment is wholly shared by objective observers. In the recent words of the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, and I quote, to the people of Ghana, like everybody else on this planet, you have been hurt by exogenous shocks, first the pandemic, then Russia's war in Ukraine, and what we need to realize is not because of bad policies in the country, but because of this combination of shocks, unquote. I've already discussed the domestic triggers behind the depreciating city. We simply can overlook the significant impact of the delayed passage of the revenue measures outlined in the 2022 budget, which resulted in negative market reactions, credit rating downgrades, the narrowing of finance and sources, and the eventual depreciation of the city. The timelines are obvious and cannot be ignored. Honorable Co-Chairs, it is time to have an honest national conversation on the patterns of expenditure as a people, our preference for imported goods which require foreign exchange that we do not earn enough of implies that our CD will continue to be under pressure. It has become clear that we cannot continue in a business as usual mode. We have to significantly change our consumption patterns and support investments in local capacity for production and export. Honorable Co-Chairs, even in these challenging times, we have not been rudderless. We have prepared the post-COVID-19 Program for Economic Growth, PCPEG, as a domestic blueprint which has benefited from input from all key stakeholders, including civil society, social partners, labor unions, employers, and faith-based organizations, academia, industry professionals, and the leadership of Parliament. This document contains a set of time-bound structural reforms and fiscal consolidation measures to place our debt levels and fiscal accounts on a sustainable path over the medium term and has underpinned government's engagement with the IMF. The negotiation with the IMF is progressing steadily and well, and we are, progress we are working assiduously to achieve a staff level agreement by end of December 2022. As the President announced recently, government is aggressively pursuing initiatives that will structurally boost the export orientation of this economy. In the coming 2023 budget and following consultations of key stakeholders, including AGI, Labor, and the trading community, we expect to announce critical measures in this regard. This will complement that ongoing private sector-led interventions being promoted under the 1D1F and the Ghana CARES programs. However, the world had no playbook to help us tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Parts of the Ghanaian economy were shut down, including hotels, restaurants, and events places. Our efforts were further destabilized by the disturbance in the global supply chain. But even in those times, the co-chairs, we provided electricity and water free, grants and loans to businesses in the formal and informal sectors. We also paid our workers, even when some were home for nine months and did not lay off anyone. The country has been saved from the disruptions in supply chains, record hikes in prices of energy, food, and commodities. Every economy is facing macro fiscal challenges, rises in public debt levels, and narrow in fiscal space. Our situation was not helped by a combination of historic weaknesses in the structure of our export import dependent economy and our low capacity, even as compared to our neighbors, in raising domestic revenues. The 2023 budget will contain policies directly aimed at tackling these vulnerabilities. 
Honorable Coaches, I am aware of the enormity of the challenges we face. I am aware that lives and livelihoods need to be protected. We have a well-consulted plan and the commitment to address this economic challenge. The Ministry of Finance and I have been working hard 24-7 to quickly restore market confidence and ensure economic growth. We are nearly through the IMF negotiations. I am confident that once we conclude our debt sustainability program and secure a fund program, the nation will next year see the stability and fiscal space that can spur us back onto a sustainable economic recovery and growth. We should endure considering on the investments we have made in all sectors. Mrs. Chairman, I'll be concluding soon. Coaches, as a child, I was taught a hymn that has guided me throughout my life. Land of our birth, we pledge to thee our love and toil in the years to be. When we are grown and take our place is it in one as of men the Roman, and women, uh, which Mr. Was it mentioned in his book, Mr. Minister. This will be Methodism. Honorable Damboche would. Uh, well, that's what I was wondering. I've seen him hanging around here. He is very good at those. Mr. Damboche, which one is that? Methodism. Uh, he would go. <laughs> when we are grown and take our place as men and women of our race, land of our birth, our faith, our pride, for whose dear sake our fathers died, O motherland, we pledge to thee head, heart, and hand through the years to be. Inspired by these words of this hymn, co chairs when I assumed the position of Minister of Finance, I resolved to serve the people of Ghana with my all. Under my tenure as Minister of Finance, I have overseen some great strides in the development of Ghana and the improvement of the lives of the Ghanaian people. As a nation, we are being tested. Our circumstances require a united and concerted response to the crisis. I employ our chiefs, elders, and church leaders to take the mantle and speak a common language. Let us all work as one country to support our labor negotiations, find a solution to the impasse in Parliament, and rise above witch hunting and entrapment. These are not ennobling and progressive for a society seeking transformation. Honorable co-chairs, Ghana is a resilient country. Ghana has faced economic challenges since independence. Ghana has always come through each of them stronger and better than before. God willing, we shall come out of these difficult times too. Ghana will and must rise again. Thank you, coaches. God bless our country. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Finance Minister. But uh, do I look like a witch? <laughs> That's just by the way. Coach, I was not aware that you've been... You, I was not aware that... You, or, or, or maybe I look like the hunter. <laughs> I was not aware that you've been hunting, naturally. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Sorry. Good for, yes, go on. Uh, Co-chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I thought you already, sorry, sorry, wait a minute. Yes. Where, where uh, the documents that, uh, Mr. Minister. Exactly, exactly. Mr. Minister, uh -huh. you propose to tender some. Yes. yes. Yes, can we have them with the, the clerk? Yes, and that, uh, that the point. Oh, that's the point we're going to make. Yes. Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, Mr. Minister. Mr. Clark, if, if you can get your people to do run copies quickly, if it is possible. Mr. Minister, are you okay? All right? Okay. Yes, uh, we, would, we would start with, uh, with a few questions, uh, by very few questions. We'll come back to questions, but we ourselves will ask one or two. And then, okay, he says you will let me, then uh, we'll get the members, and then uh, you would uh, we'll take it from there. Um, 
not, 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 not many of them. When uh, the chief inquisitor in chief, uh, no, I'm wrong. The chief provident, uh, to appear before us. He took us through quite a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, one of them being the the Physical Responsibility Act, uh, 2018, at um, 980. He was wondering if I was thinking of a certain sequence. You are capable of answering the questions anyway I put them, so I deal with the ones that I want to deal with later. So, um, uh, Physical Responsibility Act. And then... Uh, he suggested to us that uh, you violated violently some of his provisions. But I've since been looking at the, the, the act, and I, I think you, you seem to have confirmed that uh, uh, it, it could not be applicable to the year 2018. Is that right? Because you look at the act, and it, it looks like uh, uh, the president assented to it on the 28th of uh, December 2018. Uh, could it? Uh, could it possibly be applicable to uh, to the uh, 19, the year 19, uh, 2020, 2018 that uh, he, he discussed? There's quite a lot of uh, discussion of it on the page 36 of uh, our bound volume of uh, of, uh, of the, the, the the transcript. What, what, what do you say about that? Thank you very much, Mr. Kocha. I think the act was um, passed by Parliament and um, assented to by the president um, December 2018. Um, and as you know, our laws do not have retrospective effect, uh, and so you're yeah, truly, um, it, isn't, it shouldn't be applicable to numbers that occurred in 2018 and 2019. And then in 2020, um, we, um, Honourable Minister, with all due respect, if the Act was passed in 2018, it will have, it will have prospective effect and 2019 will be covered, unless it was suspended. No, he said 2019. No, he said 2019. I'm talking about the 2019 budget, which was read before. 2019 budget was uh, passed in December 2018. That's correct. Thank Fantastic. You very okay. Thank you. So would it apply to go by the 2018 by year, 2019 by year, would be applicable? And in 2020, yeah. we came especially to the House um, to set it aside. So. Yes. Okay. And there's also a matter that uh, I, I bring to your attention that you, you shouldn't really worry about. I see that uh, Ato Forsen Honorable um, suggested that as soon as um, you exceed the five percentage point by the one percentage point, uh, he says uh, the provisions of Article 82 must be triggered. I've since seen the Act. Uh, it doesn't look like that's what uh, the section says. Section 4 says most essential, and it says Parliament may, the directive, not the mandatory charge. So um, I'm not sure um, we should uh, worry our heads uh, much about that. Uh, because I said I am missing my, my things, I'm not in any particular order. As a matter that I also want you to, to address for my comprehension. Uh, in course of your deliberation, you did state that uh, Bank, of, uh, uh, Bank of Ghana, uh, the Governor of Bank of Ghana, for that matter, the institution, has got quite a lot to do by way of uh, uh, currency and the physical, um, uh, physical state of, of the country. Uh, I'm taking the trouble to look at uh, Article 20, uh, 183. Incidentally, I think you did mention it, 183, and it would appear that the responsibility for maintaining the stability of the currency actually rests on the Governor of Bank of Ghana. Yes. Is that the case? The, this is a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Co-Chair, not sure as a leading question. I did mention it in my 
in my deliberation. Well, my is leading on, on. Hey, we will discuss this here. If he thinks he can overrule me, we will deal with it over here. So don't worry about that. Yes, uh, so what yeah. is that the case? Yes. I mean, the, essentially, um, the Bank of Ghana, of course, uh, as a state, shall promote and maintain the stability of the currency of Ghana and direct and regulate the currency system in the interest of the economic progress. As such, the Bank of Ghana manages our reserves um, leading to interventions to contain. Um, but, uh, um, Mr. Kocher, I, I don't think that's an issue. Um, the Ministry of Finance and Bank of Ghana work in close collaboration, um, and as um, they use their various tools and instruments to stabilize the city, um, we also um, support uh, rail sector growth as we look to encourage more exports and find means of um, bringing in foreign exchange such as Europe on issuances, etc., um, so that we maintain. So we, we do share some of those responsibilities, but as per the act, as you said, it, it is their... Yeah, well, well, that is the point, you know, so I found it pretty curious because if uh, I'm uh, reading the Constitution, it's not really out of interpretation at all. It's, uh, it's a prose. Um, the, the Bank of uh, Ghana, uh, its governor, shall promote and maintain the stability of the currency of uh, the, the country and direct the, and regulate the currency, the interests of uh, economic progress of the country. I, I'm wondering whether you, 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 you think, it might be self-serving, but if you think so, fine. If you don't think so, it's fair for the Minister of Finance rather to be called upon to really uh, explain by way of how it's alleged that he has been reckless in, in, in uh, doing the job which by the Constitution, some other institution is supposed to be undertaking. In, if you have a view, it may be self-serving, but... Mr. Uh, Mr. Kocher, I, mean, I, I think that really may be uh, part of the, the worrying aspect of uh, being censured um, at this moment. When through a little bit of discussion, you struck out grounds one, a little bit more discussion, you struck out grounds three, and now, fundamentally, you are asking about the responsibility um, for the CD. Um, and to censure a finance minister for the first time in the history of this country, I think we can't make such mistakes. Um, I will discuss with my colleagues if uh, it will be right for us to get the Governor of Bank of Ghana before this committee. Um, but that's a matter that we'll think about uh, later. Um, I can hear you. Mr. Chairman, uh -huh. I said based on his assertion, we may probably have to... We may probably have to get the governor back. Uh, yeah, sorry, so, yeah. I beg to differ. To I beg well, it's not a debate. It's a debate time has well, started. The, the, bank, the governor of the Bank of Ghana has not been brought before us. The, the, so the, this is for our minister of the, This is for our subsequent discussion. So, okay, right. yeah, we, so we, 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 we yeah. Sorry. Colleagues, this is for our subsequent discussion. So we can't be shouting across. Let's let's drop it. Mr. Minister, yes, I also um, I heard you um, talk about. Uh, um, uh, the energy sector debts, which has bedeviled this economy. Um, number one, would you be kind enough to tell us a little bit more about uh, the genesis of uh, this debt before you go into the volumes of money that we're talking about? Um, the culture, uh, essentially, we went into um, a period in which there was need um, for um, power to avert then our doomsaw situation, uh, which resulted in a number of um, IPPs, PPAs being agreed to um, of excess capacity, uh, in a sense, more than what we needed 
I'll admit that the country has now grown the use of, of these um, megawatts that were installed. However, the nature of the contracts um, were such that they were take or pay contracts which enjoined us to continue um, to pay uh, for certain capacities whether we use them or not. Um, whatever the circumstances are, we essentially inherited a situation where we then ended up paying uh, maybe close to a billion dollars um, a year um, of charges and power that we did not use. Um, that then put um, serious strains on the economy and uh, continues to today. Over the past two years, however, we have gone into a very collaborative discussions uh, with these IPPs, and I think we're on the threshold um, of securing agreements of five of them, uh, which will save the country about $4 billion in the next coming, coming years. Um, so not getting into judgments as to why um, the issue is what we have had to pay over that period, and what fortunately uh, we are going to be able to negotiate um, to save that amount um, of money. You don't have to be judgmental, but uh, for me it is fundamental to the issues under discussion. Um, do you say that you inherited uh, this uh, colossal uh, uh, the, the debt? The, Mr. Mr. Chairman, it has not helped with regards to um, the borrowings that uh, we have to do or the pressure on the fiscal space as we try to meet these. Um, and we have been able to do that um, through managing the revenues we have, um, through our borrowings, etc., and through renegotiations. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Co-Chair, um, I think we are all uh, beneficiaries of a rather stable um, electricity environment uh, relatively um, to when we came into government in 2016, and we continue to 20, 2017, and we continue um, to do our utmost to keep the lights on. Mr. Minister, can I repeat my question if uh, I didn't drive it home well? I ask if it is the case that you inherited this colossal uh, bill that you're talking about. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, we have had to be supporting over uh, about a billion dollars. And in the last estimate uh, from the IMF, um, they are thinking that this um, energy overhang uh, will be about $1.4 billion. Um, dollars a year. That is um, part of the issues that we are discussing with the fund as to how best uh, to manage that. Uh, but yes, it's, it's been um, um, quite um, a difficult situation managing it over these, over these six years. So we did inherit um, I think you've asked a question enough times for me. I'm wondering why <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Minister wouldn't want to directly confront the matter. But um, <laughs> I, 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 I thought you would have uh, answered that we can take a parliamentary notice of the fact that uh, um, these deaths were created before you came in. But if you are not comfortable, um, they were created before we came. Uh, what, why is it taking you more than five minutes after three questions to answer that? I thought it was straightforward, wasn't it? I said diplomat, unlike you. <laughs> or maybe unlike it, he haven't. I see. Mr. Minister, I think you were sitting down and thinking, actually, this parliament does me considerable injustice. They should rather be applauding me. Is that what is on your mind? <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, I'm not sure it's the applause so much as um, saddened by the, the weight or lack of weight of some of these questions and whether they truly, as a nation, warrant a finance minister's censure. 
uh, when we go through issues of economic management, uh, words like recklessness, incompetence, uh, and this is a historic issue uh, at a time in which there's global crisis, there's work to be done, the IMF negotiations are going on, there's labor discussions, there's a budget to be read, and there's um, difficulties in economic challenges. And so that is my worry as to where our nation state has got into, where is a republic in all of this, and could this have been a discussion between myself and the Finance Committee or the Council of State to really show um, the degree of difficulty that the country is going in and the fierce urgency then uh, to proceed to tackle it. But really to tackle it, you know, as um, speaking one language as a people. Because what confronts us is not easy. It requires um, dedication, a prayerful outlook, uh, a commitment to go forward, and an acknowledgement of our part in it and um, what external circumstances um, has meted on us. And truly, this time and effort for such a historic indictment in which we are not quite clear about these issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, our colleagues would, uh, would also ask, uh, but before, no, one second, Be before I just wrap up, just to uh, put a record so we all, uh, we all know, Yesterday at 9 o'clock in the morning, I did hear British uh, Sky News, uh, K. Bailey's uh, breakfast show in the morning, actually discussed Ghana and um, said that they thought Ghana was doing fantastic, quite how it all went uh, pear-shaped. Um, they weren't sure, but it's all because of the, um, the, the genius uh, matters where we discussed, the COVID, the whatever. whatever. Chairman, uh, Chairman, I... I... Go on. I invoke order 197. Which says what? The deliberations of a committee shall be confined to the matter referred to it by the House, and any extension or limitations to it made by the House, and in the case of a committee on a bill, to the bill referred to it and the relevant amendments. It is my contention that, respectfully, we are being sent on a wild goose chase on matters that are not well, before well, What am I asking you to do on that chase? What, what am I asking you to do on that chase? I'm making a comment. Co chair I, I think that, you know, well, because there's, well, there's you, precious wait, time. Wait a minute, wait there a minute. so many questions. Wait that, a minute. Yes, you have your time to ask your questions. Yeah, Nobody's going to hurry but anybody this, up. I don't see the relevance. Uh, you may, not see, news and all you may not see the relevance. I'm bringing it up to the whole nation to be aware that our issues have been the concern of other countries and they've made sure that it's but, become a matter of public discussion. To I mean, I'm, not, I'm not asking him Mr. to Speaker. comment. Uh, I'm not asking, uh, Chairman, good Chairman, let me, let me finish. When I finish, you make your point. I'm not asking the Honorable Minister to comment on it one way or the other. I am telling the hearing, this, uh, this committee, that it's a matter that has transferred somewhere. Public information. Well, it's absolutely relevant. Uh, well, uh, no, no, no. I, um, I'm even, I'm even please, uh, Honorable Minister, please, 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 uh, please, please, the please the Honorable Minister, please respect the chair. Well, he's been, he, he's been recognized. I yeah, the chair, the chair has recognized me. Well, the MPP chair has recognized well, you. The MPU, because yes, I'm, chair I'm, you know, I'm the, I'm the coach, I'm the coach chair, I'm the coach. No, no, please, please, you know, no, no, because you see. Is it a point no, of order? Important. No. Yeah. So rule of right. my point of order. Right. And yeah, yeah. And and I was I was going I was going to say that that is a germane issue that has been raised. You know because we have to stay within the remit of the referral by Mr. Speaker, so that no. But, well, I don't I don't know whether that was. Uh, but I did. I predicated my statement by saying that uh, uh, other colleagues are going to make comments before I run up. This is a matter that came up, and then I made the point. It wasn't for him to contribute to that. Well, I, to I thought you were making said, the point to the minister, and that is why the honourable no, member, the honourable member, the honourable member came up. Even if I did, but I did it. But I did. But actually, I did it. So I don't see the basis of service objection. Can we? Honourable Japame, sir, please, you are out of order. Yes, can you are out of order. Okay. My comment is made. All right. Uh, um, who is the first? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I, I thought. 
I would give the members the opportunity uh, to ask their questions, but from the interaction... When you say NDC chairman, are you MPP chairman? NDC? So well, this is not dichotomized as uh, MPP chairman and NDC chairman. That Honorable Katie, you know, you, you, please, I said it in jest. So, oh, well, can, well, yeah, can we, let's take it, let's take it, you let's put, take it in that, in you, that context. You, okay. You, you pasted your colors to, to the, 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 the proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Honorable Minister, good morning again. Um, the interaction between yourself and the Honorable uh, Katie Hamon, my co-chair, um, with respect to Article 183 of the Constitution, in terms of the constitutional mandate of the Bank of Ghana, um, would seem to suggest that the issue of currency de I mean, uh, de depreciation, you know, the management of the stability of the national currency should be laid um, you know, at the doorsteps of the Bank of Ghana, rather than the Ministry of Finance. Is that my understanding? Mr. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, um, I think your understanding is your understanding. Well, um, okay, is my understanding correct? I, don't, I, I, I think we read the Act. Well, portions of it. Yeah, you read portions of it. Yeah, so but I think there you are can also other... But, but what I mentioned specifically is um, that we work very, very closely together to make sure that we bring stability. Right. Um, so that really should be the um, top line message that you take. As to what uh, my oath is as Minister of Finance and what his um, responsibilities are, that really is not the subject. The, the, the issue uh, for me as a Minister of Finance uh, is the impact um, that the currency is having, of which I'm very, very concerned about and doing everything I can to support, um, to support uh, any way um, to bring in resources, as we did um, with the Afri Exim Bank, um, to support that, as I mentioned, looking at investment in the rail sector uh, to push that ahead. I don't think this is a time in the country of crisis um, where um, uh, we sort of kick the ball to somebody else. So all the energies that we have, the resources we have, um, we team up, circle the wagons, and move on. And we've been doing that very well, very comfortable with that relationship. So you would agree with me that there is a, a strong symbiotic relationship between fiscal and monetary policy, won't you? Um, it cannot be. Uh, there won't be. There has to be. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, what the line of questioning is leading to. Of course, I feel responsible. Well, you, you, you would know in due course. Yes. Um, so, if you were to exceed your borrowing limits um, in a manner that violates the Fiscal Responsibility Act, do you, don't you think that that should result in a vote of censure of the kind that we are looking at today? Um, Mr. Chairman, is, is, it was your choice to sign up to a shenzha which brought a conflict of interest issue on this. It was your choice to sign up to a shenzha on accounts at GMPC, which had nothing to do with me. It is your choice when you look at the gravity of where the nation is and whether you feel strongly, as you have indicated, um, that the finance minister should be censured for these original seven grounds. Very well. Honorable Minister, do you remember that on uh, June 4th, uh, 2021, uh, you did come to Parliament to provide answers with respect to the energy sector uh, payments to IPPs on the takeover pay contracts? The question was specifically filed by the Honorable Alassan Suhini, MP for Tamale North. You remember that? Um, no, I have to. But June 4th is a date we all remember. I don't yes. Know, I don't know specifically. Not, not for the revolutionary uh, upheaval that took place on that day. I'm talking about your answer to Parliament on this matter. I'll have to be educated. On okay, so the hands of that day captured you. You gave an answer that said 
that the payments totaled 937 million. Is that what translates into the 17 billion that you have just told this committee is the amount that you paid? Um, this is June. June 4th, 2021. Okay. And this, and we are June. We are in November we are now, now November Minister, 20, Honorable Minister. We are now in November 2022. Very well. Yeah. So I'll have to recalculate those numbers to bring to you. Yes, but you were specific in your answer. You said you made 17 billion cities. I think he, I think I heard cities. Yes. No, I I just want him to confirm if that is a figure that translates into 17 billion. Is that very difficult to do? No, I can't confirm on hand, but I, I certainly will bring you the arithmetic of it. Um, you also said a lot about take or pay contracts that were signed during the um, Mahama administration, uh, which resulted in the so-called energy sector debts. Um, if you were an investor coming into an economy of this nature, would you build a power plant without a take or pay clause? That mandates that if you don't take the power, you pay. Mr. Chairman, uh, is your yes. co-chair seeking an opinion from no, the no. minister? I, no, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is a rhetorical question, and you're seeking an opinion. I'm laying, I'm laying the basis for. If he were. <coughs> okay. Can I can I rephrase the question? Can I rephrase? I, the I think question? the honourable minister is capable of um, dealing with this matter. So let let, let, let him uh, let him minister. Can you kindly um, Mr. Kocher, you know, honestly, um, we are in a crisis. I've been brought here um, for some very disparaging descriptions of who I am and my character and the management of this economy. I'm not here to speculate of what investors may think or not think at a certain point in time. As an investor, at any point in time, you try to take advantage of weaknesses and depending on the strength of who is beside you, of who is beside you or across from you on the table, you take your pound of flesh. Now, we have gone into some of these um, contracts and truly uh, recalibrating what they are. Um, so I, I can't want to be part of a whitewashing of um, events <laughs> that, that, that do, did not help us and is part of the issue why I'm being censured. Thank you. Has your government or the government um, uh, of which you are a minister signed any, any energy sector uh, contracts that contain take or pay clauses. Um, I'll have to really confirm on that. Yeah. And you agree with me that take or pay clauses are essential in energy contracts? There are, I mean, there's also a reason why there's take and pay. Right. There are reasons why there are other methods of doing that. And that comes with the so, ability to negotiate. For example, um, in 2015 or so, um, the then government, you know, did a $1 billion euro bond issuance at 10.75%. <coughs> but that even required a World Bank wraparound. We have subsequently um, done much more with lower rates. Um, so, you know, I think it's, um, it's an issue of uh, maybe competence or an understanding of how to negotiate. Uh, I think we'll be chasing our tail if we go along this line. Okay. I will give uh, members the opportunity to take their turn and then I 
I will come back. So, uh, Honorable uh, Sam Okujeto Ablakwa, uh, Honorable Minister, we will deal with the grounds separately. So, there will be a round of questions relating to ground two on the National Cathedral. And when members have taken, all members have taken their turn, will now come to ground four and five and in that order. That, that, strictly speaking, the, the approach. Yes, if, uh, yes, like, no, no, wait a minute. I mean, I mean, wait, wait, wait. Yes, okay. Um, yes, you are. It's your turn. Go. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> As the chairman, I will come to the National Cathedral in a minute. The Honorable Finance Minister has raised some issues with language which he appears uncomfortable with. I want to place on record that same day, on the 10th of November 1999, I have the hands here, Wednesday, 10th November 1999. Then Dr. Kunedu Apreku, Nana J.H. Mensa, and others filed a motion against your predecessor, Finance Minister Kwame Pepra. And if you look at column 977, they use similar words. Quote, the NDC government and Minister of Finance in particular had demonstrated absolute incompetence. They didn't say only incompetence absolute incompetence and gross negligence in ignoring sound and credible advice, unquote. If you come to column 983 of the same hazard, they said, quote, anywhere else such mismanagement is enough for people to stand back and say we have done our part, we have come to the end of the road, we have gone full cycle, we took the reins of this country when we thought there was a crisis. We have come all the way and put it back in a crisis. This is the time to leave. And if the president cannot leave because of a constitutional mandate, we want the minister to begin the process of leaving now and will continue uh, sorry, in the sorry, year 2000, oh, 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 unquote. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what is that point uh, supposed to be, to, to be clarified? What, what, the idea? finance minister is raising issue with the language of the motion. And I, I want him to understand that it's consistent with the practice in this I house. Mean, how can it be consistent? I mean, so that was raised at a time. This so is 1999. Was, yeah, that nothing was wrong with that. 10th so November, 1999. Say, whatever, then, and the minister himself, on the 12th of March, 2013, is on record at the William Uforiata Institute for Integrity Lectures to have actually called for a coup. Nothing can be more stronger than that. So I, I, I don't think we'll be no, no, taking that's, lectures that's on language from the minister. What did he say exactly? Let's hear what he said, please. He said, March 12, 2013, the country's silence on the election petition could trigger a coup, unquote. He was speaking at the William Ufriata Institute for Integrity Lectures. So, so... So it's, it's available online. It was reported by Ghana, by Ghana Web. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. No, no. I just. It's a preliminary. It's a preliminary comment on language. He, he appears to want to lecture us on language, and I and I. No, he would he would do his point of order, but um, this is so fundamental. it in the evidence. So uh, we would want it as punch for the time being. If uh, we are able to get the, 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 the tour. Can we, can we have a look? Mr. Chairman, this is not the time to be looking at information on phones. So if you can print it out to you members. Say, no, you can't. <laughs> well, let's do, just bear with us. No, let's do it. it is there's something about Imani Ghana. What you shown me is about Imani Ghana. I'm uh, talking about, and then uh, uh, retired captain 
Listen, I, 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 I think we should expand this from uh, Mr. Co-Chairman. Let's expand this. Uh, we can discuss this later. Let's get on. Uh, uh, well, our press. Is well, Hansard uh, office, uh, maintain it until we have examined it. Can we, can we yeah, I mean, these are matters of public record. So, Sammy, right, and, uh, Sammy, we will, we'll come to you in a minute. We haven't come to you yet. The chair, the chair. Yeah, we go I still maintain that because of the nature of the statement, let's, let's expand it for the time being. And then uh, if we get the printout and we verify we are happy with it, we will know what to do. Yeah. So, so, oh, okay. So, uh, hands out of his take note. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think the Honorable Yimadu was raising a point of order. Uh, what well, order are you coming I'm only under? pleading with okay. you, the coaches that the whole Ghana is looking at us. Yes. And therefore, I entreat you that some yes. comments should not be entertained at all. This statement that Honorable... But are you revisiting the statement the, 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 to the, the hearing comments, of the whole world? The, well, it's been expunged, so let's yes. go on. Okay. But I'm saying it for, for, for this to guide us because you make a statement that a statement has been made in the hands that this statement was not made by the Honorable Minister. So how do you use it against him? Very so, well. Immediately the, the point is well noted, right. Honorable Thank Ayyemi. you. Yes. Honorable Coaches, I will begin my substantive questions on the National Cathedral matter. I note from the Honorable Minister's response that he appears to set his own parameters and proceeds to answer them. He says at page 6, item number 12, Honorable Co-Chairs, three days ago, when the proponents were here, they alleged that I had made payments from the contingency fund to support the National Cathedral. I want to state that this is just not true. Let me be categorical. I have not taken no money from the contingency fund to make payments for the National Cathedral. He proceeds, paragraph 13, it appears the proponents have confused the contingency fund with the contingency vote. Let me explain. There is a difference between contingency fund and contingency vote. Coaches, I've been going through the verbatim report, the official because I didn't hear the proponents say this. And so when I went through the verbatim report at page 29 of 165, and honorable members can refer to the verbatim report, page 29. The honorable Harun Idrisu, he says, and I quote verbatim, I would like to start with the National Cathedral. Ghana is a much respected religious country where there is coexistence between both Muslims and Christians alike. Nobody is against the president promising and honoring God with the cathedral for the expression of the Christian faith. But when public resources are used for that purpose, it needs us to call into question. I just gave the clerk to the committee a warrant signed by the Honorable Minister for Finance for some amount for the cathedral, and that is what you are holding. I will tender it in evidence and say that we are aware that by warrant signed by Honorable Kenuforiata, Minister, 29th October 2022, and an expenditure of 142,762,500 Ghana cities was allocated for the construction of the cathedral. 
We want to know when parliamentary approval was granted for this purpose. And then also, I refer to the Auditor General's report. I will just speak to and yield to Honorable Atufosin, unquote. Nowhere in this verbatim report did the proponents say that money was taken from the contingency vote or contingency fund. Indeed, if you look at the grounds, Honorable Co-Chairs, it's very clear, and I'm surprised that the Honorable Finance Minister circumvents around the very clear grounds provided in this motion. It says, and I read, unconstitutional withdrawals from the consolidated fund in blatant contravention of Article 178 of the 1992 Constitution, supposedly for the construction of the President's Cathedral, unquote. That is the ground. So I want to find out from the Honorable Minister where this matter of contingency fund and contingency vote is coming from, because we don't see that in the verbatim report. Honorable, Honorable Minister, did you listen to the question? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I surely did. Um, that's very, very well. So can you answer the question? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, the, the question here um, seems to suggest that there was unconstitutional withdrawals from the consolidated fund. So I went on to define the two different funds in which one might make a mistake and made it very clear that A, we did not go through the contingency fund and that we went through the contingency vote. Um, so, I mean, I think that puts the issue of constitutional illegality. Uh, Mr. 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 Minister, one second. You see, we are not all quite conversant with some of these economic terminologies. Maybe that is also conflicting the issues for with the committee member. So what are you saying? There is a distinction, and if there is, please clarify. There's a distinction between what is here, um, clearly written here, consolidated fund, and then the consolidated vote. Is that what you're saying? Contingency, contingency, contingency vote. Contingency. Oh. One second, Sammy, one second, one second. Sammy, one second. Is that what you're saying? Um, yes, um, but, but I think, um, Co-Chair, where the Honorable um, MP is suggesting that there was no mention of contingency vote and or contingency fund, and so I have missed no, no, in the, the question, question, question the, let's look at it again. It says specifically there were withdrawals, uh, two items here. There were actually three items. There were withdrawals, one, two, from the contingency fund. Uh, for, forgive me, forgive me. If you talk in unison, we're going to be all confused. <laughs> Consolidated fund, two. And then the third one is the constitutionality or otherwise of it. So... You have uh, the consolidated fund here, and then you have the unconstitutional element attached to it. You seem to be drawing a distinction between the consolidated fund and then the a third one, a, a second one, which is what? The contingency vote. The contingency vote. So, so let's see if there is a, there is, there is a, let, let, let's get it right. Happy for your technical people because that's why they are running. No, I, uh, if there's any issue that the technicals uh, can help, we have no difficulty at all. Yeah. Mr. Coach, I mean, it was important that we made that distinction, and um, essentially, what um, Honorable is saying that it's unconstitutional to have withdrawn proceeds uh, from the consolidated fund. And I was making it clear that whatever money comes from the consolidated fund goes into 
number of um, items that could be anything and in the um, consolidated vote uh, maybe resources that we go into consolidated uh, contingency vote where we go through our contingency uh, fund uh, which we did not use um, and so that really is my line of discussion if it was in his mind inaccurate at least I have confirmed how we got those resources and used them. Uh, our colleague, Honorable Obama, I think has some clarification. Honorable yeah, Minister, the question, the proponents on um, three are alleging that you made some unconstitutional withdrawals from the consolidated fund. Yes. Have you made those withdrawals? Simple. No. The, the Honorable Finance Minister has just said in response to Honorable Pat Patrick Boamer's follow-up question that he has not made any such withdrawals. Is that, is that my understanding? Mr. Blackwa, I said unconstitutional. Please, for the avoidance of doubt, please. So, if it is constitutional, can the Honorable Finance Minister let us know when he received parliamentary approval for the said withdrawals. I have two withdrawal warrants here, 29th October 2020 and 31st March 2022. Do you have any parliamentary approval to proceed with these withdrawals in the 2020 budget and in the 2022 budget? In, in 2020, you withdrew 142.7 million in 2022, you issued instructions of Control Accountant General to withdraw 25 million. I've gone through the 2020 budget, the appropriation. I've gone through the 2022 budget, the appropriation. There are no such approvals. So if you contend that they are not unconstitutional, can you help us with the basis for that contention? Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I get quite nervous about um, the, the level of passion on the construction of the cathedral. Um, we certainly did receive uh, parliamentary approval um, for whatever we do with our contingency vote, and that is what I went through to do that. C can you please help us with evidence of that approval? Of the approval of the budget? How did you get the approval you referred to? And the other government obligations. I have looked at the... And, and I believe I have the liberty at that point. Even if you come and uh, it is really shocking that such a major project will be treated as a contingency. It's shocking. I've, I've, all my 12 years in this house, I've never seen this. Let's get something right. Yeah, you said that it is shocking. Wait, wait. Sorry, colleagues, no, let's get this right. Is it? I think we are dealing with the constitutionality or otherwise of the issue. Your emotions don't come in. Well, it's shocking. It's, uh, well, it really doesn't come in. Is it constitutional or it's not constitutional? Let's deal with that, please. Well, um, it is on, on, oh, sorry, honorable co chair. If the expenditure was incurred without conforming with the constitutional procedures, such as getting parliamentary approval for the expenditure, all right, even under the Public uh, Financial Management Act, that will be expenditure in excess of appropriation. And therefore, the finance minister would have even breached the statute. So the question of constitutionality is not here about inter I mean, the interpretation. It is about compliance with the constitutional procedures for the expenditure of public resources. And this committee and parliament 
can delve into the constitutionality or otherwise of actions taken by the finance minister with respect to the expenditure of public resources. And I think that is where the honorable member is coming from. But so where, he's where, asking, where, one second, no, where uh, I put clear to the minister, we'll come to it. Where I put to the minister, minister did indicate the source of the money. Other government, is that what he said? Other government obligations. The point then was that, is that unconstitutional? Honorable KT Hamon, um, I mean, you can go on. Honorable co-chairs, I hold in my hands the appropriation bills for the respective years. I also have the reports on Office of Government Machinery for the years in issue, 2020 and 2022. Nowhere in their reports to Parliament when they accounted for expenditure in those years, did they report to the House? Can the Honorable Minister for Finance tell us why that happened? Because the practice is, even if you come under contingency, you must report to the Finance Committee as you seek approval for the ensuing year. Why was Parliament kept in the dark all these years? Furnish us with the document that he is holding so okay. that we can appropriately respond to the question. Because for me, the problem is with the use of the word in the motion unconstitutional withdrawals. Very well. Now, the only institution that can determine that any act pursuant to the Constitution is unconstitutional is the Supreme Court. Well, so if he used the word <coughs> unlawful withdrawal, then he the onus and the burden of persuasion is on him to show us how that withdrawal is unlawful. The minister has already explained that there was uh, an appropriation and then the, uh, the payments were made out of the contingency vote as part of the appropriation for other government business obligations. I don't see how that is unconstitutional. And if um, the honorable member has a contrary procedure, which in his view is the lawful procedure, then he must show us. Very well. The, um, what the honorable member is doing, he will finish you with the document that he's holding. Um, but that evidence, okay, the, if you say that it was under other government obligations, all right, it must be a line item in the budget as approved by parliament. It must be a, well, excuse me, uh, very well, uh, no, uh, on, uh, council, yes. you know, I know you are my senior at the bar, oh. but I beg you, I'm the chairman of, one of the chairmen of this committee, all right, so, and council, council, council uh, would listen to the committee and its members and not argue with us. Thank you very much. So, um, they, no. By, by not arguing, you mean he can't make his point? Or no, not, he can't. Uh, he can, no. Honorable, calm, calm down. Calm honorable, down. honorable, Please, calm honorable. Down. With all due respect, calm with all due respect. Calm down. If we were debating this uh, motion in Parliament, the, honor, the, the uh, counsel to the Honorable Minister would not have had the opportunity to be at the bar of Parliament. Once we are here, and he has a right to counsel. 
All right. I expect that council can make his submissions, but not interrupt the chair when the chair is making a point. That is the point that I'm making. Honorable chair, the point is very well noted. Thank, thank you very much. That note, I mean, we have to stamp the authority of parliament. It's not about Dr. Ayine. It is about the parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, I'm happy to tender all the documents I'm referring to. No, you are not tendering. You are a member of the committee. You, you, make, you finish them with all okay. the, the documentary evidence that you have uh, referred to. Very well, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the guidance. So I will make them available through you to the clerks and to the witnesses. Yes, yes, they can. Uh, the, clerk can, the clerk can come for them. Uh, uh, let's confirm with us that it, I, you need to have a look at them now to be able to answer or well, what do you want to do? What's your... Honorable Co-Chair, as a factual matter, we are of the considered opinion that there was no violation of any constitutional provision. There was also no violation of any subsidiary legislation and the, um, we will educate ourselves with the, the facts as disclosed by the documentation in the possession of the honorable member, but it will not change our opinion. <laughs> so what is the exercise in giving you? You won't change, change anything. So the point I was making is that you want it now, you want the documents now, or? Yes. We, we, we would like to see, but you can go on with this questioning. Yes, but the, for the specific answer to the question that was put to the uh, Honorable uh, Minister, he has already explained, and at the risk of sounding repetitive, I would say that the payments were lawful because they were authorized by an appropriation. And subsequent to the appropriation, the the payments were authorized out of the contingency vote on the specific allocation made for other government business. And the <laughs> Honorable Minister, <laughs> and the, sorry, go, um, other, other government obligations. And the Minister illustrated that point when he referred to payments made on, be, on, on behalf of the Black Stars in 2014, as well as um, the current uh, Qatar uh, uh, delegation. It's a sim similar situation. We would be <coughs> hard pressed to answer that question. That, if... that, is, that is well taken, Council. The fact that a violation might have occurred in 2014 uh, doesn't doesn't mean doesn't mean that it cannot occur. It can. It should not. That a finger should not be. No, please. That is that is an expression of their opinion, right? Very, very well. Hon Honourable Members, order. Uh, please, please, the Honourable Ministers around the table, I know you are here to support your colleague, but I am pleading with you. I am pleading with you. Yes. Ple yes, you are heckling the members of the committee, and that's, that's very unfair. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is very unfair. You Please, can, can, we, can we have some order around the table and let, let the Honorable Okujeta Blakwa ask his questions? Thank you, Honorable Members. Well, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairman, for the protection. The, 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 Honorable, the Honorable Minister for Finance is still proceeding strongly and uh, the contingency provided, contingency vote provided for under the Office of Government Machinery. Other government obligations, yes. I have asked the Honorable Minister to let us understand respectfully why, after you have done that, you did not report to this House, as has been the practice, because other government obligations, the Finance Committee and the Plenary will approve all of these matters after. And then the 
new budget for the ensuing year uh, will also receive subsequent approval. How is it that until we intercepted these documents, Parliament didn't know at all that apparently public funds were going into this project, contrary to the initial promises anyway that the Ghanaian people uh, had been told? Honorable um, Co-Chairs, it's really not a practice um, for a line-by-line -line reporting, except under goods and services, CAPEX, etc. Um, if it's a new um, approach that you would like to suggest, I think we'll, we'll consider it. I think my my um, discomfort was the issue of constitutionality. So, Mr. Chairman, can the Honourable Minister recall that on the 28th of November, 2018, when we debated the 2019 budget, the minority cautioned that, and I quote, this is, uh, I hope uh, Dr. Yeni doesn't mind me quoting verbatim from what he said at column 2893 of the 28 November 2018 budget. He said in the penultimate paragraph, Quote, Mr. Speaker, I have reviewed the budget statement itself, and there is no statement whatsoever which relates to the National Cathedral. In other words, there has been no request for any estimate to be approved by this House for its construction. Mr. Speaker, a number of critical questions may be asked at this point in time because the Honorable Minister for Finance mentioned it in his speech, but it is not contained in the budget statement. I would want to ask four critical questions about this budget statement. Mr. Speaker, the first one is, what is the value of the land to be provided by the state? I am aware 21 townhouses that were built to house our judges will be demolished for the purpose of the construction of the National Cathedral. Mr. Speaker, another critical question is, what is the cost of running the Secretariat for the entire duration of the construction of the National Cathedral? How much is the seed money to be provided by the state? And on and on, there were no answers. Does the Honourable Minister recall this debate? And is he able to tell us that the practice now for such important projects, national and national edifice, some estimates putting it at $400 million, that he's going to always hide it under contingency till it is completed? Before the Honourable Minister answers, did you say that there were no responses to what you... What yes, you, yes, can there, I, can I have there, were, there were no the responses at all. Answer. Yes, the hands out of 28 November. So uh, if he recalls this debate, because some people have uh, uh, argued that probably... No, the, but he wasn't we, in the house to have been able to respond. Is that a point? Yeah, but the, mm -hmm. the, the convention in this house is that the ministry must be represented during the... During the so the debate. it and wasn't like a question put to him directly, but it was no, during the, the debate. The debate. The so debate. He couldn't have been there and he couldn't have responded. Yeah, but does he well, recall that we raised these let, concerns? Let's put that on record. Not that he avoided answering questions. Yeah. We, we raised these concerns during the debate. So what we are doing now is not new. Does, does, he, does he recall? And the second part of my question is that is it a new practice to classify? such a major national project, $400 million under contingency. Thank you very much. Um, Co-chairs, I think on, on Tuesday, we were very, very particular about the issues of particulars um, for this censure to make sure that we work within the remit. Um, the question 
is one of constitutionality, which apparently we have been able to clear the air on. Um, and now, um, drawing us uh, into a fishing expedition um, becomes a very difficult thing. I don't think we will be able to finish this. And if it's really a motion of censure of the finance minister, and it is these issues that are directing us to that, I think we need to be a bit careful. Um, so, we can certainly update Parliament at any time on these issues. But I think the people of Ghana should know very clearly that the issue of unconstitutional withdrawals did not occur. And we could have and sure that it didn't come by. But in fact, I think um, Honorable Atto Forsen, if you look in the Hansard, um, did mention uh, something about contingency fund anyway. Um, what? So, um, I'm not sure um, the Honorable Member as to the issue of value of land um, cost of the secretariat, um, how much seed money, is this a new practice? Um, I'm, I'm sure we could have resolved these things outside of the ambit of constitutionality, which is what I've been brought here for. And that is a heavy, heavy charge. Mr. Minister, I, I think I keep on assuring you that the, the, the question of, uh, we're not here to interpret the constitution, uh, we're not here to enforce the constitution. If anything, we are applying the dictates of the constitution. I think the point is settled. As far as I'm concerned, it's settled. It may be throwing additional information, but for me, it is settled. The question was that some monies were taken for the purpose of uh, the building of the cathedral. Unless, of course, there's a categorical denial that any monies were taken, then uh, it's an entirely different matter altogether. But if it's admitted that some monies were taken, I think your point is that you took it out of a certain, uh, uh, a certain grant, a certain vote. I think you call it other government obligation. Uh, that's where you took the money from. You said that that came to Parliament for our, our consideration and approval. Well, uh, wait a minute. No, no, I'm, sorry. I'm not debating you. Yes, I'm yeah. trying to make a point. Uh, yes, I mean, that is the point that uh, you have made. He says that, as far as he recalls, there was some discussion in Parliament along these same lines. We may have, you went there, so you'll be able to answer that question. We debated this and raised exactly the question that he's raising about the, uh, how much was involved, whatever the money is. Your point, as far as I'm concerned, it's what you made already, and that's what your lawyer said. So the constitutionality argument, it, it, it shouldn't trouble us at all. Um, there, there are Meet modalities. The one second, one okay. second, one second. This is the constitution. To take money out of the uh, uh, government, uh, government, whatever, constitution provides for how it is done. That, I think, is the constitutional he's talking about. The government, uh, other obligations and whatever, they fall under the same law. And your point is made clear that this is how I took the money. So, constitutional arguments don't come in here. Uh, my, yes, my colleague, Mr. I want to make a contribution. Mr. Chairman, indeed, uh, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, I keep talking about feelings of people getting surprised no, I'm, and getting because, because I'm, 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 I'm uh, very well, very well. I'm, 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 I'm making reference specifically to page 134 of 165 and then also page 135 of 165 where the Honorable to posed the question and if you permit me I'll read. He says Mr. Blackwa, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. On the National Cathedral, Dr. Atuforsen indicated that Article 178 has been breached because there was no authorization by Parliament. I have heard some government communicators say that perhaps the Honorable Minister of Finance can come under contingency and do what he has done. Is that a view you share? Does the contingency fund under our constitutional arrangement allow an honorable minister for finance to 
do what has happened in this case. And this is a response that Dr. Forsen gave. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I am not aware that a contingency fund in particular can be used for such a project. The Constitution is clear on how the contingency fund can be used. For the Honorable Minister responsible for finance to be able to use the contingency fund, he would need the approval of the Finance Committee of Parliament. You would recall that during the COVID-19 era, the Honorable Minister for Finance appeared before Parliament and got approval under the Constitution requirement on contingency fund. So clearly, uh, the, the, the transcript for, from the first day of hearing suggested that some contingency fund process had been employed. And that is why no, the minister... No, not at all. Honorable Minister, you are out of order. You are grossly out of order. Why am I out of order? You are out of order. You are out of order. You are, complete, you are completely out of order. The portion that you, the portion that you have read all right, was a reference to what government communicators have said about the use of the contingency fund. And, and, and to be clear, to be, to be clear, the contingency fund is a specific creature of the Constitution. And there are, pro, there are, there are, there are pro, constitutional procedures. And in fact, the uh, Honorable Minister himself has appeared before the Finance Committee when I was present, where he asked for approval under uh, Article 178 of the Constitution Okay, because there are unforeseen expenditures that have to be made, for which provision has not been made in the appropriation bill of the prior year. So please, you are, you are, you are completely out of order. Respect. Please, please. Respect. Can we, can we, respect. no, no, respect. please, uh, respect. Honorable Mesa. Respect. If you respect. will take your turn to ask questions, you permit me. can you because clarify, no, 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 uh, please, no, I, I think, I, I think there is, there is a, there is a, a determined effort to put hurdles in the way of the Honorable Ak uh, Okujato, and I don't think that that is, that is fair. Mr. Co-Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, Mr. Mr. Co uh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, Sami, 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 you are a member of the, the senior and from the member of the committee. Everything will be done to make sure that you have your say. Don't worry about it. But don't worry, don't worry. These are legal arguments. So when we settle uh, these arguments, you will have a free flow. But Mr. if you say that uh, there is a deliberate attempt to put a pediment, what word do you use? Uh, that is the same as deliberate, isn't it? You know, to, to put impediments, you are not being fair to the committee. Sami, go on, make your point. The minister would answer to the extent that he can. The committee, in the end, would make our determination. Chair, the, the minister's categorical statement is contained at paragraph 12. Nothing that has been read so far confirms what the minister said at paragraph 12. The proponents did not allege that payments had been made from the contingency fund, as he says in paragraph 12. So we will settle that one. Move okay. on with your next question. And then, uh -huh. and then Chair, I, I would also need... I, I would need, I would need your direction, Honourable Coaches, um, <laughs> Honourable Katie Hammond, and Honourable Dr. Yeni. My understanding of what we are doing is that the the the, the pursuit of Article 82.4, which is a referral from the Right Honourable Speaker. We are to make a determination, fact-finding of a sort, and we will submit our report to the House for debate, for a decision to be made. But consistently, I keep hearing the Honourable Witness saying that, oh, this matter has been established. This matter has been settled. Is it is it for him to determine for us so I mean, if, if it was the constitutionality or unconstitutionality wait, 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 has been determined? We'll, we'll I need your guidance. So I mean, we'll rule on all of that. I mean, we're not going to be able to shut or to shut his mouth. To, the minister is entitled to some sort of statement. So in the end, we are here to determine for ourselves what, what exactly. It is. I mean, he's talking about the constitutionality because that consistently I'm saying that we are not here to determine the, uh, the, the constitutional yeah. matter. We are here to apply the way of the constitution. So to the extent that he makes uh, his statement, we would then just oppose it against the constitution and see whether we are able to apply the details of it. Hey, no, no, don't pick, pick and choose every little... No, no, no Chair, it's, 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 it's important. We really need to make some progress. Colleagues, um, the shouting march across uh, 
across the table and all that, not entirely helpful. Uh, let's let's calm down. Let's let's. Uh, so, chair, I I can proceed, and you, I you, you can. But I I will assure a lot of time. I will assure the the honourable minister that I'm not on a fishing expedition at all. Even that, though the four that, 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 that comment from itself is overruled. <laughs> so, the honourable minister says that some seed money government contribution. Can the honourable minister let us know the value of that seed money, the quantum? What is that seed money? Most respectfully, honourable co-chair, um, we are here pursuant to the motion that is on the floor of Parliament. And the context in which the Speaker referred the matter to this committee is clearly stated on the face of the motion itself. And as far as I'm concerned, the question just put is veering out of the context of the motion. In what, in what respect, uh, Mr. Kwasamsi? Um, Honorable uh, Chair, the um, remit of the inquiry that we are doing here is to establish whether there is a factual basis for a censure based on the provisions of law. Presumably, in this instance, the, um, the Constitution. Uh, the, the Constitution and the standing orders. Yes. And also the. Uh, the physical. Uh, the, the, yes, the fiscal, the fiscal Responsibility yeah. Act. Yes. Yes. All right, the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so the, the facts that we are gathering must be the facts that relate to the context in which the, uh, the censure can be evoked. Yes. And as far as I'm concerned, the last question that the honorable uh, member asked does not in any way advance that process at all, because it's outside the remit of the, the scope of the motion that is on the floor of parliament. So, uh, yes, I can, I can understand. But we're going to make a ruling and move away from this question. Yeah, we, yeah, we would. But I understand the, the point that uh, Sami was making. Sami is saying that, well, Mr. Uh, admittedly, some monies have been taken. Uh, he's got some warrant for whatever. Uh, he's got quite a bit of it here. Something has been taken. I think he wanted some clarification from him. He doesn't probably trust the evidence he has. So he's asking him, confirm, how much have you, been take, have you taken? Minister doesn't remember how much he's taken. He doesn't remember. We can move on. I mean, it shows, I mean, um, you have the warrant. And the fact is made that monies have been taken. Let's make some progress, please. Honorable and for you had your hand up. Was, my, okay. Mine is really a response to the, the, the issue. Mr. Chairman, mine is a response to the issue being raised by Council for the Finance Minister. The Council for Finance Minister brought a response. And in the response, he is stating categorically that some payments were made towards the cathedral. So if a member of the committee wants to know how much payment was made, I, I, that, I, I do not uh, think he's uh, 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 Colleague, that's the matter that we moved away from. Yes, uh, he wanted uh, to say Chairman, uh, I think uh, we are wasting too much time on this. The Constitution makes an exception for withdrawals from the Consolidated Fund under Article 1781B Roman 1, with your permission. And the Minister has clearly stated that the monies that he took for the purposes of the cathedral was based on the appropriation that parliament approved and it says no money shall be redrawn from the consolidated fund except b1 by an appropriation act and it's clearly laid the foundation that he got it from the other government obligations 
line. Period. I think, I I think it's clear. Well, well, that's what that it's one. clear. I mean, you are next point. You won't ask any more questions on this one. Sorry. Unless he can establish a contrary fact. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, move on. Well, no, yeah, but he has to finish. Yeah. Or the the chairman, yeah. when you go through the verbatim report, the proponents. Wait, 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 this is still on. Which yes, one? National Cathedral. I'm still on the but National not Cathedral. on the money. No, no, I would. I would, I would yes, I, I trust my uh, intercepted document, so no problem. I, I would, uh, uh, yeah. I I'm sure the National Security <laughs> Apparatus is here. <laughs> Who are intercepting documents? I would, I would grant, I would grant uh, the, the lawyers that if they don't want the minister to respond, that's okay. But going through the uh, verbatim report, the proponents also indicate that there were other withdrawals uh, with the contend are unconstitutional withdrawals for payments of architects, for relocation of judges, for compensation of uh, demolished properties. Uh, what does the Minister of Finance have to say about that? I mean, are we not revisiting the same point? The, wait a minute. The point is that he's taking some money. Yeah, he's taking money from uh, wherever it was taken from for the all the allied matters related to the cathedral. So what is what is the better? Uh, to what? Agree to what? Put the person. Does he agree to which one? Can he confirm they were Have you not uh, shown us this this document? Compensation. Council, we just want your client to confirm if these withdrawals took place. That's it's a yes or no answer or an explanation. So that is there. Honorable Chair, honorable co chair, sorry, my apologies. We do appreciate this, but we seem to think that this question is related to the overall question that was posed in relation to the um, cathedral project. So it appears that we are revisiting the same questions in various forms, and that is our concern. We seem uh, to think that, we seem to uh, think uh, that the Honorable uh, Minister Council, has Council, with, with all due respect, I, I think, uh, welcome to the world of uh, Parliament. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable <laughs> you, 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 you probably are thinking that you are before the Supreme Court justices. No. This is not, not this all. is not a judicial setting. Not, not at all. No. Yes. So, so allow the, the honourable member to ask his question. Your your client is entitled to you know answer yes or no, and then we can proceed. Very well. Is anybody we're waiting for answer or we should go on? Mr. Chairman, yeah, we, we, sorry, say it again. Honourable Minister, are you ready to answer? Um, sure, or, Mr. Yes. Chairman. I, um, you know, I, I thought the the primary issue was um, the legality of where we took the resources from, and I think we've explained it. Um, uh, and so now it gets to the question of the. Yes, specificity of these things, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not have that here. Very well. Honorable Ablaqua, uh, 
Do you have any further questions? And then we can move on to other members of the committee. Well, Mr. Chairman, I will rest for now and uh, okay. cede to other members. Very well. Honorable uh, Patrick Guama. No, I am offering you the opportunity. Okay. Honorable uh, Ejafa Mesa. About this is friendly fire that is coming, so don't be worried. Finance Minister, the issue about contingency vote and contingency fund is it the usual course of government operations to expend, as you indicated in your response? referencing specifically the funding for the World Cup uh, 2014 and also the World Cup 2022 for matters that are not specifically provided for in the budget to be funded from that vote. Is it the usual course of government operations to do that? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, um, it is, uh, there's precedence and it is a practice. Um, and I guess the, the issue of the creation of that um, line item or pocket of resources is because we live in a world of uncertainties in which there will be emergencies. And that allows for um, nimbleness or response, you know, when it's needed. And so that's where the contingency vote um, comes into play. Obviously, this is not uh, an activity of government that started when you became finance minister. No, sir. I, I think we have the famous issue of Brazil that is very graphic to all of us. That, that will be all for now. Uh, very well, uh, Honorable Ahiefo, do you have, oh, sorry, Honorable Zenato, before Honorable Ahiefo. Zanetto. Thank you, Honorable Co-Chair. Just for clarity, would the minister kindly inform the committee on how much the government of Ghana has spent to date on the National Cathedral? That matter is settled. As a matter of sentence. That is the, that is the point. Wait a minute. That is the... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Please, 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 please. We are here for a purpose. We are not going to be repetitive. We are not going to repeat that. The matter that we got bogged in with Sami uh, was the question of uh, how much. Uh, has it been paid yet? Has it been paid yet? He said, I think we were here. We heard him clearly that uh, he might not be able to recall exactly how much has been paid in total up to the he, he made that one clear and your question again is that well could you tell us how much has been paid in, in, all, in, in all in all fairness uh, coach uh, the in this age of electronic communication and you know the, avail the easy availability of information from the honorable minister's uh, uh, ministry that I mean, the sum total of the expenditure to date can be, can be put together easily. I'm sure uh, Eva, you know, can do that, retrieve that easily from her phone. You know, so please, uh, it's a fair question. For the purpose of this? Well, I mean, to, for, for, for purposes of getting, you know, I mean, the minister to answer the question. Honorable Minister, we are waiting for the figure. Honorable Co-Chair, yes. on behalf of the Minister, you would recall that on the first day... To the oh, so, uh, Honorable... Uh, um, sorry. Council, yes. are you raising a legal technical point? I, I am...
If you want to testify on behalf of your, your minister, your, your client, then I'll let, I'll let the, the reason. You want, you want to be sworn in? I don't want to be sworn in. If I were to be sworn in, I would... Witness of fact. Of we don't know about the truth or otherwise of your testimony. Yes, but Say. That, that evidence will not even be coming from proper custody because I don't work at the Ministry of... Very Defense. well. Yes. So... But, at any rate, what I'm, I'm just trying to uh, lay the context in which the minister is probably having um, a difficulty offering figures now. Because at the beginning, we opined that we needed particulars of the, the charge or the grounds that he was supposed to answer. If these had come in, it's just a matter of adding figures at the ministry and coming here to deliver the information. And I will go back to the motion on the floor of Parliament. It is not the duty of the minister to offer information that will, um, uh, excuse me to say, uh, promote his censure. You know, the, 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 the promoters yes. of the censure motion, they should have collated all this information before they came here. Council, so it's a very simple matter of the minister saying that I do not have the figures. Exactly. This committee will not reject that answer as inappropriate. Yes. I don't know why. I think he has yes, said so, that. yeah, if he says he doesn't have the figures, no one is going to compel him to produce them. Yes, Honorable Ayer. No, is that on a point of order? Uh, yes, Chairman, or, or with due respect to Council, this matter crop up regarding furnishing the minister with particulars. This committee has taken a decision that after the evidence of the proponent, there will be a transcript furnish the finance minister. And that has been done. And some figures have been alluded to in the transcript. So I do not sit down here and have the feeling that regarding the transcript, there is any element of surprise to the minister. So if the minister, upon receipt of the transcript, is still maintaining that he is not aware <laughs> of the figure, who we'll take that as an answer. So let, 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 us, let us point him to the page where that particular uh, figure is, and then uh, let, him, let him comment on it. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my friend. No, it's, it's okay. Uh, the minister, minister is in. I need to answer his question, and then... Honorable Co-Chair, am I to take it that I will not be given a response to my question? Because as a house of record, I could mention a figure that I have. Would the ministry be in a position to corroborate this by providing us with documents afterwards? That, 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 that's, that, 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 I think is a better approach. You got a document uh, like Sami had something. You know, you want to flash it at him and you want to see clarification of that. We have no difficulty with that. But you ask based, the based on the total number I have so far, the amount that the government of Ghana has spent so far on the cathedral is $199 million U.S. dollars. Yeah, I beg your pardon, U.S. cities. I beg your pardon. No, the amount of money spent by the government of Ghana to date is $199 million cities. I corrected myself. May I? Is that, is that correct? And um, will the ministry be in a position to furnish the committee with the figures to either corroborate or otherwise the amount of money government of Ghana has spent on the National Cathedral to date? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, we will be able to do this. It will. Co-Chair, the uh, minister mentioned in his response on page 7 that the money was taken from what he referred to as a contingency vote. And my question is whether all the approved amounts have found expression in the budget subsequent to that, because usually this is an emergency or an ad hoc, but this is, appears to be an ongoing expense. Has this found expression anywhere? Has this found expression anywhere in the budget, in subsequent budgets that the minister has presented to the House?
Could you please clarify that question a bit? Honorable Senator, the Honorable Minister is asking that you clarify. What I'm referring to is um, the minister mentioned that the money that was spent on the cathedral came from a contingency vote, which is part of the contingency fund, um, uh, Office of Government Machinery. Has this uh, government other, other government obligations, I beg your pardon, has this subsequently found expression in budgets that he has presented to the House subsequent to this? Honourable Minister. Madam Co-Chairs, thank you very much. It hasn't found the expression that um, the Honourable MP is, um, is seeking. Uh, but I think when we look at the Auditor General's opinion, uh, Attorney General's opinion, I'm sorry, um, uh, we should, you know, in the ensuing years, as we stabilize how the fund then will come, it should be able to come through that uh, entity. So yes, nothing, no expression has been found as we speak. But given the opinion, um, I would imagine that's where. Documents. Okay, very well. Given that um, you clearly stated, um, Co-Chair, given that the Minister clearly stated that the information on the cathedral on page 9, I beg your pardon, in the new document on page 8 of the Minister's response, um, 18I, where he refers to the announcement of the establishment of the Board of Trustees and the Secretariat for the Castle, I beg your pardon, Cathedral, II, the um, approval of the groundbreaking the groundbreaking ceremony and also the how the, let, the letter of intent signed and then in IV the announcement of the expansion of the cathedral project to include a Bible museum um, for me the the question I have is given that all of these are so clearly stated can the minister provide information or a, be, a bit of clarity to the committee why the amounts that were spent on the cathedral were not outlined as clearly as all the intentions and um, ceremonies that went along with the, um, the committee, uh, with the cathedral, I beg your pardon. Well, the minister has answered. Zami, you don't have to put it on record, but tell me, I thought you were Catholic or Methodist or Christian. Or, you are not a Muslim, that I know. You are not. Neither am I anti-cathedral. You know that in the Bible, you know, in 1 Chronicles, 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 Chronicles, the Lord stopped David from constructing a cathedral for him because he had shed blood. So, when it comes to the house of God, God wants us to proceed in holiness, in purity, in cleanliness, so, but to, you, to you, edify you, you and to glorify Him. You have an answer, so, are you Methodist? No, are yes, you... I, I, I know where you are headed to. I'm, you you I'm like not a atheist. I'm not a pagan. Um, this, 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 this strategy will be... I'm doing the Lord's work. You made your point. 
is in fact the chairman partially out of order. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, let's yeah. We really have to. Um, so, what's what's going on there? <laughs> Mr. Co-Chair, I, I did mention. Um, the Attorney General's um, opinion, uh, which now is going to recite um, all of this um, for the Museums and Monument Board, and will therefore, um, in the ensuing um, representations to Parliament, um, hope be a lot more specific as to how um, the financing um, would be done. That's, that's a, fair, a fair answer. Please proceed. Are you, are you done with your questions on the cathedral so we can make some progress? No, not yet, but I thought we were making progress by going through each item. Yeah, very well. So please uh, yeah, proceed with it. Yeah, the cathedral. Yes. Are you not done with the cathedral? No. Yes. I've, I've actually only asked, I think, two questions, but each question has taken a while. So, yes. Um, my, my third question, if my numbering is correct, is, is to do with the, um, the consulting, the architectural consulting firm that has been um, taken on board with regards to the, um, the building of the cathedral, the design and all of that, the construction. Is the ministry in a position to tell us how much is being given to the, the consulting firm and the architect? Specifically, Mrs. Sir David Ajay and Associates. Oh, should I? Mr. Yeah, Co Chair. I think this, this may be the third um, question with regards to the specificity of numbers. And um, I think I've answered that question. Uh, that uh, if need be, that could be provided. Um, Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the... Be provided, very well. Okay. Yes. And um, if, if I may ask a question, co-chairs, just seeking your direction um, and asking a question to the minister on the current, the questions we're asking and a question in hindsight, would you permit? My question would be to the minister whether in hindsight he would have presented the um, expected expenditure related to the cathedral to Parliament in a more um, transparent, I suppose, way Hans to I, avoid. I got it down. Hindsight is 2020. So maybe I know. We'll, we'll hence my on. question. We'll, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, we won't deal with hindsight. So, let's so you won't give the current, minister an opportunity your to. Your current question. Speak what's your to? current question? Don't deal with hindsight. <laughs> I think the minister has even answered that question. If you are listening, he referred to the Attorney General's opinion and said on the advice of the Attorney General, they will do things uh, differently. So we are looking forward to how differently the Minister will do things. So are you done? Yes, thank you. Very well. Um, Honorable Buama, no questions for the Minister. Uh, Honorable Ben, Ben Ada here for. You have any questions? Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Since our, start, our side just stopped. Kwame, do you want? No, no. I, in fairness, that's the procedure. So, I, I, you know, I, in fairness, that's how we've been proceeding. So, I don't want Kwame to think that I'm, uh, you know, being unfair to him. But if you want to yield to him, that should be fine. Okay. Honor. Very well. Very well. I mean, I'm yielding the opportunity to ask your questions now. That's what I meant. Okay. Thank you.
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to just ask a brief question to the Finance Minister on the issue under reference. Honorable Finance Minister, you tendered Attorney General's opinion in evidence in support of your evidence. Was the opinion of the Attorney General available at the time you were making the first payment to the National Cathedral? Mr. Kocher, opinion was in um, 25th March 2022. <coughs> so, when was the first payment made? Um, I'm sure it was way before that time. As, as you know, we cut sort somewhere 5th March um, 20. Or so. Now, if you take a look at the opinion of the Attorney General, he never advised you on payment, but rather the legal status of the cathedral. Is that correct? correct. That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah, the legal status, that's correct. But never on payment. Um, not that I read in here, but once you have a legal status, it informs the direction in which you will take. Which I disagree. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Very well. Honorable Kwame, you may do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have only one question. Um, Minister, it is true. It is true, is it not, that government funding had not been the only source of funding for the National Cathedral, if you know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, um, Honorable MP. Uh, that is very true, that there's been a whole um, series of fundraising by the Cathedral Secretariat, um, including um, the Ketua Bianswa and um, various activities which have been had to fundraise both locally uh, and also in the U.S. and U.K. by the Secretariat. Okay, thank you. Any other honorable member wants to ask a question? Uh, if not, I want a clarification from the minister with respect to the, the technical term contingency vote. Would you normally use a contingency vote for foreseen planned expenditure? Um, Mr. Co-Chair, the issues we deal with in finance are, are numerous and, and complicated. Um, there may be a foreseen expenditure, but there may be an emergency payment that is required. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I can be very helpful of that. You announced the construction of the National Cathedral in the budget of 2017, is that correct? Uh, or 20, 20, 2019, sorry. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. So clearly, it is something that 
your ministry uh, anticipated would be the subject matter of some government expenditure? Um, possibly, Mr. Mr. Co-Chair, uh, there was also uh, vigorous efforts uh, on the part of the Secretariat um, to fundraise. That, that, that is not, I, I, I do understand, and if I have, the, if I have the opportunity, I'll give you a check for that. But which, which can we concentrate on the public resources that you are deploying for the construction of the, the cathedral and the approval processes? So, what is the question then? Yes, so the question is, at the time, at the time that you announced the construction of the cathedral, you clearly anticipated the deployment of public resources towards its construction, didn't you? And we did indicate um, the issue of government support with regards to the land, the secretariat, and seed money. We did. And in, in subsequent the... budgets, you came under other government obligations in order to um, utilize public resources for the construction, right? That's correct. Would you describe such as a contingency vote? Would I describe? Yes, the, your, because if we, accept, not, uh, if we accept your position that the resources were allocated under other government obligations, right? So let's take for the sake of argument that they were allocated under other government obligations were, and approved. They were, they were taken from other government obligations. That's very well, different from. Well, the there, there was a vote of uh, an envelope of resources approved by parliament. So the animal called other government obligations was approved by parliament. Sure. And there was an em envelope of resources, you know, available under other government obligations, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the resources for the cathedral were then taken from other government obligations. That's it. Right. So my question is, um, would you still describe that as a contingency vote? Since you planned ahead, you, 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 the envelope of resources was predetermined, wasn't it? It was predetermined, uh, 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 Eva, Eva Mens. Yeah. It was predetermined because that line item certainly had a figure that Parliament approved. No, no, see, no. Are you saying, no, please, uh, Kwame, you had your turn. Are you challenging the chair? No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. When the chairman is making that point, I think, I think it's fair for us to listen to him. When there's a difficulty, we would, we would try and... Uh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. When chairman, chairman is making the point, go chairman, go chairman is making... Yeah, sure, so, so let, let me finish. What is... Go on, go on, ask your question. Some, some silence, please. Uh, yes. Honorable Dambucho, you want to answer the question? No, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 uh, uh, you are done with your questions. Actually. Yes, I'm, I'm waiting for the answer. Whether there was a figure. Whether there was a figure for other government, other government. Yes. There will be figures for that. Very well. Thank you. Um, yes, cathedral matters. Cathedral matters. That. I think it's been suggested that 
Uh, Minister, I might want to take a break, not so much about us, but the Minister himself. Um, um, we are open. You want us to do 3 o'clock before we have break, or you want us to... Uh, sorry, Mr. Wipri, what are you saying? Huh? Council... No, no, in terms of break, council has no say. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, I'm different about this. Honorable co chairs, I think we'll prefer to do an hour more before we do take a break if necessary. Before we took a break if No problem. That's a joke, please. So I will yeah. start the next round. Um, um, next question. The question is in respect of which one? So, the next one is um, is it the physical recklessness? Uh, uh, which which one? On your list. Well, we've done the first one, which is the cathedral, isn't it? Deliberate. So we do the so deliberate. Deliberate and dishonest uh, misreporting. Is that or it? let's say misreporting of um, data to parliament. Yes, colleagues, is that the one? Yeah. Yes. All right. No, no, we just cannot say, let's say misreporting. There was a categorical allegation against the minister. Yeah, he said yeah. deliberate and dishonest. Yeah. So that's we why. just cannot say, that's why. That's oh, what's on the let's paper. Say, Minister, please. the next one is that we're going to try the question and see if any of our colleagues, yes, who want to, if we don't have questions, we'll move on. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, thank you for giving me the opportunity to start on this subject matter. That's uh, deliberate and dishonest misreporting of economic data to Parliament. And Mr. Chairman, my question will come from the transcript. There was an issue I take it. Yeah. No, you don't remember exactly which page. Yes, I don't remember the page, but you can check from page. Well, I'm uh, The, the, the question of misreporting in our transfer start from page uh, 36, I ran to 37, 38, and uh, I think uh, to 39. So um, if you have the transcript, you can have a look at uh, those pages. But, but you, you don't need to rely on the transcript. The question, I think, as posed, it's clear. It's Can you repeat the question for the, uh, yeah. Honorable Minister, the question is that in the year 2018, the Finance Minister reported to Parliament a fiscal deficit of 3.8% to gross domestic product, and deliberately and dishonestly, This key expenditure item is included 
in the fiscal deficit accounting, the actual fiscal deficit would have been 7.1. Yes. Mr. Co-Chair, I think we have gone through um, these issues of um, the reporting over and over, and we did actually uh, put out a memo um, to explain what we were doing. So it is not a dishonest, <laughs> deliberate misreporting, and that we always, if you look at um, some of our our budgets and um, our appendices, you will clearly see the line which indicated what was above the line and also um, what was below the line, which typically, um, at least since we came into government, have involved the issue And the treatment that we're using was not illegal. Did the number get exhibited? Of course it did. But if that's our treatment, that is our treatment. And the treatment was not illegal. So should I take it that the key expenditure of 9.8 billion was treated below the line? Mr. Co-Chair, the expenditures on energy and FinSec were huge. There is no question that if the previous government had taken care of the AQR, we would not have been in that situation. Whatever it was, it was an extraordinary expenditure. It was one time, and that is how we elected to treat it. And that was not illegal. If you look at the IMF documentations, even they would have, you know, the number you talked about, which we accepted as what the deficit is. And then they would also say uh, what the number was if you were to add those two numbers. So the issue of dishonesty, we want to dispel that. Deliberate misreporting, um, thinking that you will not see the number in our documents you will see the number in our documents. Our choice as to what is over the line or under the line, that's for us to do. And we thought that was appropriate at the time until a year ago when we said that we mostly paid off um, the FinSec um, expenditure and therefore we can bring it up. We also made a decision on the energies, energy um, expenses and also brought it about the line. Will I be right in my mind that if the key expenditure of 9.8 is included in the deficit accounting, then the deficit for the year 2018 would have been 7.1 instead of 3.8? I think you are, you are talking about accounting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. An accountant has various treatments, Very well. and those are not illegitimate. Okay. And not only did we um, accept or agree as to the method of accounting, mm -hmm. we also stated it in our documents. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, the Secretariat is not able to uh, show what we have here. Uh, but if you were to look... Okay. We're not able to project that. Um, so yes, so it's not dishonest because it's on the page, it's recorded. Is it deliberate? Is it treatment? Is it a choice of treatment? Have we changed the way we do it? Yes, we have changed the way we do it now. You know, is it um, common for accountant principles to change? They do change. Honorable Minister, similarly, in the year 2018, in 2019. You reported 4.8% deficit. And again, you have excluded the financial sector cleanup 
payment of about 3.1 billion and energy sector payment of about 5.1 billion. And would it be the case that if the financial sector cleanup and then the energy sector payment is included, the deficit would have been 7.1 instead of 4.8. Um, Coach, I'm not sure where, where we are going with this, um, with this discussion, since I have been very, very clear about the method of treatment. And I've also been very clear that even when you look at the IMF data, they will give you those two numbers. Deliberate, dishonest, misreporting. There was no misreporting. The numbers are clear for everybody to see. And I'm explaining to you why we did what we did. Honorable Minister, I would not be wrong to say that your choice to report above or below the line was informed by the various provisions in the Fiscal Responsibility Act. I'm not sure. I mean, I was the one who brought the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Well, how were we treating it prior to the Fiscal Responsibility Act? And the fact of the matter that the Fiscal Responsibility Act um, came into force, you know, um, in 2020, actually. Um, so deliberate and dishonest, while the numbers are clear for everyone to see, I, I fail to understand. In the year 2020, you came for a suspension of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Is that That's correct? That's very true. And even that year, you reported a fiscal de deficit of 11.7. Is that correct? That's true. And again, the actual deficit was supposed to be 17.2. Um, Co-chairs, I don't think we have made much progress unless there's a lack of appreciation of the fact uh, honorable the minister honorable minister i i with all due respect i think you know the the member wants you to confirm certain facts to the committee so please just go ahead and confirm those and then we'll make a lot of progress thank you no not necessarily to confirm it's putting those into you if you disagree you disagree but i think it's going through the Wait a minute. It's fine. We are dealing. We are dealing. We are dealing. We are dealing with it. That is fine. It seems to be going through what was stated by Arthur uh, uh, in uh, this report. Uh, so he's putting them to you. You agree. You agree. You don't agree. You don't agree. Uh, Nobody is hanging the issues around your neck. So it's, I have made it very clear that the issues of um, the FinSec and the issues of uh, energy were treated below the line. And I've also made it clear that that is what we at the Ministry of Finance agreed to do as an institutional way of dealing with this. I've also made it clear that since um, 2021, 20, uh, 22, we have agreed that we bring it above the line because it's no more an extraordinary measure. And so there will be differences. But the, the fact of the matter is that, yes, there's the with or without, and those numbers were in our books. They were not hidden, and therefore they were not dishonest. Honorable Finance Minister, I'm now coming to the year 2021. The deficit re reported was 9.2% of GDP, but the actual deficit that should have been reported should have been 12.4% of GDP. What do you say to this? Honorable, honorable co-chair, honorable MP, 
I think it's the same line of questioning uh, that we have gone through from year um, to year. And um, I insist that we had a certain way of treating, we're consistent with, um, in terms of uh, making it clear with or without was also in the books. Um, so nothing was hidden. What is the limit in terms of percentage points of the fiscal deficit per the Fiscal Responsibility Act? Um, it is 5%, and if you go beyond another 1%, um, then a vote of censure could be. So it's been argued before this committee that because of Section 2 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, you are deliberately and dishonestly misreporting below the line so that you could operate within the ambit of the Fiscal Responsibility Act when in real situation you are operating contrary to the law. For which reason that should be a vote of censure? So, um, that's in relation to which years? Because I thought we heard him say that in terms of the current years, he's actually given clear instructions on what it should be done. So this is in relation to which years? Mr. Co-Chair, I started from 2018. One, now, one, in 2018, minute, if you look at the transcripts, 2018. Yes, if you look at the transcripts, See, so the proponents are minute, with a view. Wait a minute. If we were also listening, in terms of uh, 2018, we have ruled here that the law was not even applicable. Chairman, co chair, probably that would have been your interpretation, which is different. And distinct from no, no, the view. No, let, let, me, let me finish the point. When you say my if you view, look at your own transcripts. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Calm down, you will talk. Don't, don't, worry, don't panic. The, the act is here. The act is here. This is not interpretation. I keep saying that it's an application of it. We all understand it. The, the matters occurred before the, 18th, uh, the 28th of December 2018. The law came into force on the 28th of uh, uh, December 2018, and you're talking about 2018 matters, matters prior to that. So, no, 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 he said, you heard him, he said that in terms of 2018, and I retorted by saying that in terms of, that would already have ruled on that, not applicable. So he can make progress by moving on to 2019. Mr. Coach here. Yes. In fact, if you listen to the proponent, they are of the view that as of 31st December, the law was in being. So that is their so argument, is and it is for the committee no, like, to make that were, particular determination. You are a member of the committee. We are telling you that statement made that. But that is what you are saying. Money. I may take a contrary view, well, you, and you, that my contrary view should inform the question be, that I should ask. You seem to be a member of the. You seem to be a member of the committee. No, no, no. Honourable Co-Chair, I believe strongly as a committee, we have not taken that particular decision that the Fiscal Responsibility Act. It's not applicable as at 31st December have you had 2018. To we have not. Have you had an opportunity to peruse a copy not. of the Have you had a copy of the So we'll come to that particular determination. No, we, we if that determination that is made, that is fine. And I also mentioned, as a lawyer, I know that once the law has been assented to, it takes effect, effective from the date of the assent. So therefore, what the committee must look at is that this particular law, when was it assented to? Is it before or after? Now, somebody is talking about 28, somebody is talking about 31st. That is why I am of the view that these are issues. That's the law. The law is yes. 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 And somebody is talking about us at 31st December 2018. And move further to establish ben, 2019. Honorable, well, I'm here for yes. you. You made, a, you made a point yes. about 2019. Yes, 2019. Can you rephrase your question in respect of that and then let the honorable yes. so answer? So the proponents are of the view that deliberately and dishonestly, the finance minister is misreporting just to circumvent the law per Section 2 and Section 4 of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. It's for the committee to 
I deny that categorically. Very well. Yeah. Bernard, do you have any other questions? Very well. Yes. Um, any other member on uh, misreporting? Oh, yes, uh, Honorable Mesa. Chairman, uh, just a quick glance of uh, the dictionary meaning of misreport. It says to give a false or inaccurate account of. So, Finance Minister, is it the case that you have given a false or in a inaccurate account of any financial statements to Parliament as it's being alleged? Coaches, honorable, no. Finance Minister, I read from your written response that these deficit figures, both with and without, were actually reported in the financial statements that you reported to Parliament, correct? That's correct, sir. And that is the same reporting that you report group with and without oil, correct? That's correct. Now, your reporting on growth, if you are accused of misreporting when you quote your growth figures without oil, would that be accurate? <laughs> that would be completely inaccurate, sir. And if you report your growth figures with oil, would that be misreporting? That would not be misreporting. Thank you very much, Chairman. Very well. Um, any other member? Yes, uh, Honorable Blakwa. And then uh, we'll take Kwame. Honorable Yimedu. And then uh, Honorable Zanato. Thank you very much, Honorable Co Chair. I want to find out from the Honorable Minister why he consistently pursued the path he pursued until April 2020. And this is after we had raised concern about his style of reporting. He was quite consistent about pursuing on that same path. Until April 2020, when he had to put in an application to the IMF, a copy of which I have here, a request for disbursement under the Rapid Credit Facility for $1 billion. How does he explain the two different scenarios? In Ghana, consistently, even though the minority had raised it, he wouldn't budge, he would not depart. But suddenly, when he had to apply for $1 billion from the IMF, he changed the methodology from the IMF uh, documents I have here. How does he explain the sudden change in his philosophy and his uh, methodology? Thank you very much, Coach. Um, I think we come back um, to the issue of whether um, these two numbers, with or without, have always been available to all. And if you look at um, the 2022 IMF Article 4 report, uh, you can see very clearly um, the with and without. So I'm not sure about the question of a turnaround or anything else that um, Honorable Member may be alluding to. You have earlier on admitted that you had a different view and that moving forward you have changed that view. But I am saying that based on the evidence available, the records we have here, 
it appears that the one billion dollar application to the IMF is the cause for that U turn. Are we right to come to that that conclusion? Um, no, the IMF always had both with and without. Yes, and the IMF country director said publicly that they disagree with you, um, your handling of the below the line items. Dr. Mama was clear about it. Uh, however, on the 6th of April, you seem to now align. Uh, was it because there was $1 billion at stake? Um, Honorable um, MP, as I mentioned, those numbers have always been available to the fund, to us, in our budget, to Parliament. Honorable Co-Chairs, how does the Honorable Finance Minister respond to the assertion by the proponents that we are where we are now, the debt distress status, the crashing out of the international bond market, and all the downgrades we are suffering from rating agencies because of this, what some people have called creative accounting, that it hit our true picture, our true financial situation. And that is why we are where we are now. How do you respond to that? Um, uh, we, we want an explanation of the expression creative accounting. Creative accounting, where the IMF clearly states that they disagree with your kind of accounting and they oppose the items that you treated below the line. That is how I am defining creative accounting. Oh, I didn't use the word creative accounting. Yeah, those are my words. Well, can, we, can, we, can we stick to the, that words used by the IMF? Yeah? I can withdraw creative accounting. Uh, the question still remains that your style of reporting which we contend strongly and forcefully that is misreporting, is what really hit our true picture and created a certain false sense that this economy was robust. That is what has brought us to where we are, according to a lot of pundits and analysts. I want your views on that. Thank you very much um, indeed for that. Um, your style of reporting. Um, coaches, once we as an institution decide on a certain methodology, it is open and transparent. We've gone through a lot of bond issuances. These are sophisticated investors. Um, who are clearly aware of all our numbers. Everybody always knew about the amount of resources we spent um, for the banking cleanup. In addition, knew about the liabilities we also inherited in the energy situation. So let's put um, any thoughts aside that our finances uh, were being and deliberately hidden, and people do not have a clear view of that. Because in the IMF appendices, you will see with or without. And I think we should get that clear. And therefore, there was complete visibility on those numbers. We can therefore not link them, in my mind, to 
um, the logic that you have proposed, then that is what has led us to where we are. Finally, Mr. Chairman, on this specific ground, the IMF insists that the decision you took, your style, your approach, deviated from international best practice. How do you respond to that? I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, with due respect, um, co-chairs and honorable member, um, that is a fair characterization of how interpretation of treatments are, especially when the institution you allude to also records those numbers. Actually, have they said that? I have, have, have they made that, that, that's the point? I need to be sure. Have they made that point? Where, where, where do we find that? Sorry. It's, it's in the 2019 staff report. Sorry, let me just put Page it a bit nine of the of the twenty. That it's supposed to be in one of those. 20, is, it, is it your recollection 20, that the twenty nineteen staff report? I'm not sure. I'm just wondering whether the it's Mr.'s recollection that IMF actually did make that statement. Well, they are, they are going to. Uh, if if I can, if I can. Uh, Read it with your permission, Mr. Chairman. It says, um, I'm reading from the 20, December 2019 IMF staff report. Let's be clear if they have copies. Um, Mr. Minister, is there a copy for you? Page, which page are you reading? I'm reading from page 11, paragraph 16. 2019, page 11, paragraph 16. Paragraph 16, yeah. Under public financial management, it's, it, it says, the fiscal rules could be further strengthened, box one. About 2.8 percentage points of GDP in financial and energy sector costs, financing part through ESLA bond issuance, were recorded below the line in the 2019 budget because the government considers the financial sector cost as one of an energy cost as debt amortization. Best international practice, best international practice, emphasis mine, would include these transactions above the line as they reflect either direct government obligations or government transfers to SOEs. In addition, spending on roads, cocoa board, and potential infrastructure collateralized on bauxite export, Sino Hydro, should be recorded in the central government budget. Targeting a sustainable debt to GDP ratio over the medium term could effectively guide fiscal policy and reduce uncertainty about the debt trajectory. Unquote. This is the matter. Made his submissions. That, uh, I think we did say that. Well, they, they are not by this saying that they did anything wrong. They said that uh, best practices. My question. Not... My question was clear. That that the IMF is saying that what they did deviated from international best practice. No. That's the no, IMF no, 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 is saying that best in, that best international practice would include those costs. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. Okay. Me, I just read it. No, it's very right. clear. No, it says that what they did deviates from best international. Yes, but best not, international but not unlawful, unlawful. No, I, that was not my question. That was not my question. I'm just asking him that the IMF says what they did deviated from best international practice. So what does he say to that? What is his response? Mr. Uh, um, Co-Chair and um, Honorable MP, the treatment um, of the one-time extraordinary expense um, for the banking um, cleanup, and then the inheritance of these um, colossal energy IPP, which we inherited 
um, from the previous government. You know, we had to be clear on how to treat that. And I think if you go to maybe the 2018 reports, um, you see <laughs> clear understanding um, by the IMF as to that. Now the issue then, as to our belief in that this was an extraordinary event and therefore it must be treated under the line, we all agree to that. As to the issue of best international practices or practices that are acceptable because of the unique nature of your circumstances, we have to make a judgment on that for a country that is growing. Um, with that regard, it was those same numbers that we then use effectively to be able to also go to the international markets. Okay. Fiscal treatments, acceptance of um, liabilities, and how to ensure that you are able to um, finance your budget, get appropriate resources to go forward. Those are our considerations that we have to make. So I, I wouldn't really, with all due respect, um, make a judgment on the way in which we as a country or the ministry um, decided to treat us. And now we are getting out of that situation and therefore changing the way in which we do our treatment. Eighteen, Ghana was under the fund, the IMF. Is that correct? Yes. The proponents of this motion have actually made a statement here, and I would want you to clarify. Page thirty-seven. The second paragraph, Honorable Atoposi says, and I quote, with your permission, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, again, Section 2 says that the primary balance must always be positive. So if a minister breaches it by one percentage point, then obviously the, the vote of censure may trigger. What we have seen is that over the years, even though the Minister responsible for finance has been presenting some economic data to Parliament, in the year 2018, Mr. Chairman, we can see it from the presentation projected on the screen, which he did, that our Honorable Minister responsible for finance and the government has said to Parliament that the fiscal deficit was 3.8% of gross domestic product. In fact, in the year 2018, the reason why they said it was 3.9% of GDP was that a key expenditure worth 9.8 billion was excluded from the fiscal accounting. They treated it below the line, and this has to do with the financial sector payment. Now, my question is that when you present your financial reporting, since Ghana was under the IMF, what was the view of the International Monetary Fund over this period, 2018? if they provided any. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, there was, um, 
when we came into government, um, which is honorable, the issue in front of us was whether um, to trigger um, a report um, uh, which really suggested that our banks um, were bankrupt and if we do not do something about it, uh, we are going to get a real cataclysmic environment of people losing their savings. Um, now, that was not a part of the expectation, but the ECF then had literally um, derailed. So we took uh, the bold decision uh, to move on with that. And the bank, um, the fund, agreed with us that given the extraordinary nature of that expenditure, we should treat that as such. Yeah, done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable uh, Patrick Boma. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, no, no, no cross. Uh, Chairman, uh, this is yes. the, the or re examination. Proponents stated clearly on deliberate and dishonest report reporting of economic data to Parliament. I want to find out from the Minister the consequences of such an action on the, on the country if it had happened and whether this country has been subjected to any fines for misreporting to the fund before. Thank you. No, I, I object. I raise, a, I raise a, a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Our no, the, the, no, the ground. Sorry, no. He's, he's, please, no, he's, he's misquoting. He's misquoting the ground. Yes. The, the, did, the, did the ground say that the misreporting was to the IMF? He didn't say that. Yes, to Parliament. So why are you saying that? Uh, why are you talking about IMF sanctions? The misreporting was to Parliament. So please, let's call the grounds properly. Let me refer Mr. Kujeto to the deliberate and dishonest misreporting of economic data to Parliament. So how can IMF sanction you when is the so, IMF Parliament? So I'm coming to that. I'm referring you to the Minister's response on page 10, paragraph 23, and I quote, in actual fact, in the most recent IMF Article 4 report for 2021, ONICES clearly demonstrated that the methodology utilized in computing the deficit is and has been consistent with the table shown labeled so so and so. So we are talking about a reporting formula to Parliament which is consistent with what the ministry has been doing to parliament and to the fund because you recall that we came out of the IMF program in 2019. That is the basis for my question. And I'm asking, even if I exchange parliament with IMF, would there have been any consequences? And if so, whether it's happened before under the Fourth Republic? Allow the minister to answer the question, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the, the sad, um, well, the fact of the matter is that um, we went through very successfully 2017 to the first quarter of 2019 to exit um, from the fund program which we inherited and from the previous regime. Um, and yes, we wouldn't have been able to exit if um, there was this misreporting that they were talking about. And typically, you get fined for that. Um, as far as I know, historically, it's only um, the previous regime um, that had encountered a misreporting in which a fine was exacted. Honourable oh, Minister, Honourable Minister, well, 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 well. Uh, 
no, 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 no. Um, honorable, honorable, honorable minister, honorable minister. Yes. Uh, so you are so diplomatic. I don't understand your language. The previous government. Is it a government? Uh, he, he, he belongs to which one? That is. It is. Well, the the narrow ground is about misreporting to Parliament, not to the International Monetary Monetary Fund. So, so this uh, no, the Article Four was to buttress the fact that there has been there has been misreporting. So please, 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 please. Okay. So. Um, that question is out of order. This is very much in order. Do, do you have any other question? Do you have any other question, Honorable Padukwama? Honorable members, does anyone have any more questions? Oh, sorry. I, I, thought, I thought you were taking your turn. Honorable Zanato. Yes. Um, we have, we have uh, about 12 minutes to our lunch, agreed lunch time. So... If you can do it within that, that will be fine. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll oblige you to continue. Thank you very much, Honorable Co-Chairs. Um, my first question is to um, whether the uh, Finance Minister and his team actually have a copy of the, um, the, the piece of evidence that was um, tendered in by the proponents with regards to deliberate and dishonest misreporting of economic data to Parliament. There was, a, there was a PowerPoint presentation, and my first question is to find out whether he, they've actually seen it. I think we asked the clerk to supply them with everything. Yes. Clerk to the committee. Yeah, but if there's a copy here, we can throw his way, you know, then depending on the question, he can. Clerk, if you have a copy, sorry. Yeah, I'm asking him the clerk yeah, we, got a copy. We serve, we serve them with copies. No, no, do you have a copy here? Yes? Is that a copy? Hmm? Yeah, so they have one now. Yeah, so go on then. Okay. On the page number three, there's a table that refers to various um, indices, and uh, it mentions 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And it's talking about the percentage deficit. In 2018, it's uh, 3.9, 2019, 4.8. 2020, 11.7, and 2021, 9.2. But below that, where a revision of the figures is made based on the um, what would have been below the line being brought above the line, the revised figures there, we have a percentage deficit of 7.1 for 2018, um, of 7.1 in 2019, 17.2 in 2020, and 12.4 in 2021. Can the minister kindly let us know if any of which of these figures were the ones that were used to inform the IMF of um, the uh, indices regards Ghana? What, what, what do you want to what do you want to understand? What is it that you didn't understand? No. Place it on record. She's, okay. She's asking the minister to provide some figures as to what figure had been presented to the IMA. This is a, a table that was given by the proponents. And uh, what the proponents had said on these figures was that these numbers ought to have been the, the targets. That, that was what we should have received. It never came from the ministry. So I don't think it is fair to was say that, 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 that... That wasn't my understanding the last time Ato came about with this figure. Then we asked him, and uh, if uh, my recollection is right, he said that this were a figure they are taking out of some official documents. 
And I placed them in the, the what is it, what is it? Uh, sorry, what is it? The projector, the presentation. The power so he said that he's taking them out of uh, those official documents presented here. It's so called objecting. That's why I said we should give a copy no, to the no. minister. Put, put the, you know, trying to get clarification. The document is, minister has got a document now. Let's, uh, honorable members, let, order. let's get the minister to have a look at the document. He can respond. If it's nothing that he wants to say about it, he saw the choose about the figures, he can say it for himself. Mr. Minister, did you hear the question? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't think it's um, a new question. I mean, it's the same chasing our tail as to whether the number is right or wrong. We have been very, very categorical that we know both numbers. The fund knew both numbers. Our budget knows both numbers, and therefore Parliament always knew those numbers. Now, as to the treatment, whether you add it up or you don't, that was also clear. So in the fund documents, you would also see with or without. I, I'm trying to understand the issue of treatment versus deliberate and dishonest. Honorable Chair, my question was specific to the table. We, are, we have been given material, which is making reference to material that came from the Ministry of Finance, and all I'm trying to do in my question at present is to ascertain whether these figures are correct. Uh, you, you get what she's saying. She's saying that these figures come as alleged by the proponents. These figures come from uh, documents produced by you. Whether you agree with uh, the data the IMF described it or not, it's an entirely different thing. But are you aware? Are they, are they known to you? These figures, are they known to you? Um, Mr. Chair, these figures are known to us. They are. The issue of misrepresentation it's a different matter altogether. Well, the, the issue of how they have them be represented here um, to give the impression as if um, these are numbers that we would not have revealed, um, I think it's a disingenuous. Very well. The Honorable Minister, that is your view. Can the Honorable mem Member then continue with a line of questioning? Honorable Zenato. Zenato. Thank you. It, that's, no, it's a, that's a version. <laughs> to, to be on safe side, you realize that I've been calling her doctor, 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 doctor. Uh, so, so we all have to adopt that. You know. Zanato zan, zan, or Zenato. You don't have my kind of tongue. You have, uh, how, you, how are you going to do it? Very well. Honorable uh, Ajiman Rollins. At least I can, I can pronounce that one better. Yes, thank you. Um, Honorable Co-Chair, my question to the Minister is, given that both figures are familiar to the Ministry, um, was there a specific, I know he said copiously that conventionally, but was there a specific reason why the, um, the figures on the top line, which were the, the, the lower figures that I mentioned, were the ones used in the budget presented to Parliament as opposed to the, the ones that are below, which are the bigger figures, which I mentioned. Um, Mr. Co-Chair, I don't know whether, you know, my misunderstanding of English is here. I, I have consistently said that those numbers are in the books. Uh, on, honorable Minister, are, are you uh, say, suggesting that we have a problem understanding uh, our own questions. No, I, I have a problem. Very well. Coach, uh, I, I have a problem. I think it's a, it's a chibi upbringing that is. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know how differently I can answer that question. For the sanity of all of us, why don't you take the figures again and then explain, educate us? We we'll probably need education from you. Try and then let, let, let us comprehend uh, what these figures are. Mr. Mr. Chair, there, there's not much education involved here. There are numbers which lead, because of our treatment, um, to a certain deficit number. 
they are two incidents that we have experienced, i.e. the financial sector and the IPP, um, and both, uh, Mr. Chairman, are results of legacy issues. Both are a result of legacy issues, which we inherited and we are, we were looking to resolve. Um, and therefore, they were also classified as extraordinary um, events, and that is how we chose to treat them. Um, that's the answer, Honorable Member. So, um, do we have another question or we can go for a break now? Thank you very much. Um, three o'clock, one hour, four o'clock. We'll be back. Thank you very much. Luna, the Please listen carefully, God is speaking to us. It's that time again. Impact 2022. Today, we block the delays. We override the delays. We will celebrate the victory and the trial. Put your cancel, cancel. Every delay tactics 